on this episode of Spirit Talk. The medicine trusts that it will find you um, and the space will find you. Like it, it's there, it will come around um, and you have a strong intention, then the healing will come. You know, you have to have it. It can't be for a good time. You know, I also teach people about the dialogue we use. This isn't, this isn't a psychedelic drug trip. Like when you're in college, you know, your LSD or your acid. This is this is a very sacred um, space and ceremony that we hold. And coming in with that mentality, I think, is is really important. Um, and and it will really carry you through through the journey. Um, respect for the plants because and um, they will come and get you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chris Fleming, the creator of Spirit Talk. You're listening to the podcast where I'll be bringing you the greatest thinkers, researchers, and contributors from around the world to discuss what we know in the field of the paranormal, life after death, and the pursuit of higher consciousness. Welcome to this month's edition of Spirit Talk. Uh, This is Chris Fleming, and this is going to be one of the longest Spirit Talks ever. And I think it's an important one. But first, I want to share with you a couple things. I have dived back into illustrating about six, seven years ago, and I've also shifted my style a little bit recently. Now, I have a Bachelor's of Arts in Fine Art from college, and I've always been doing drawings and illustrations going back to three years old when I was doing finger paintings, and I actually still have a lot of that artwork from my childhood. But some of my friends are artists, and over the years, I've been inspired by what they're doing and deciding, you know what, I'm going to get back into the art community. Back in the 90s, I was an art director. I was a freelance artist. I worked for a newspaper company and then advertising, um, creating designs and layouts for advertisements as an art director, but also did freelance art on the side, creating logos, doing illustrations, paintings, murals, and uh, graphic designs for various t-shirts and magazines. And I've missed it, man. I have just missed it. Being in the paranormal and doing stuff, you know, for the past 10 years and to really clear my mind and overcome the pain that I've been dealing with because of my car accident, I've just dived back into art. You know, like a voice said, what can you do? And that's what I'm doing. I've been doing my artwork. So I hope you guys enjoy it. I hope you love it. You can go check out my Etsy store, uh, Chris Fleming Artwork. I sell prints. And I'm going to be having a sale from November 17th to November 30th, a Black Friday sale that's going to go on for those, for those weeks. If you use code BLACK20, you will get 20% off. Now, these prints come at 11 by 14 size as well as 10 by 12, and they're gorgeous. And I'm not just saying that, but the feedback I've been getting from people, I'm just so pleased that everybody's enjoying my artwork. Every print is on a gallery quality gicle and it is signed and numbered and they are limited edition and they come with a certificate of authenticity they come in a uh, protective sleeve and a backing board and they'll be shipped directly to you so for this holiday stock up buy some prints for your friends or for your own art collection but get them during the sale because they're going to be 20 percent off if you use the code black 20 b-l-a-c-k 20 i will also have the link at Planet Paranormal for this podcast that you can go to directly. The other thing I want to share with you is that it's come to a time now uh, after meeting with my doctor regarding my neck injury, things are getting worse. And I'm not going to bore you with all the physicalities that I've been dealing with because I like to try to stay positive. And my dad said to me before he died, be strong. And then as time went on after he passed away, he said, be stronger. And I've had to be even stronger in dealing with the pain and the neurological issues coming from my neck area. So in seeing my doctor, I'm at a stage four. What does that mean? Well, he told me stage one is death. Stage two is paralysis. And then stage three is neurological issues with arms and legs and uh, to where you can't move them. It's not complete paralysis, but it's to where you lose those functions. I'm at stage four. Uh, My nerves have been getting damaged because of the neck injury, the stenosis, and I've been having flare-ups and pain in various parts of my body, as well as sometimes my my legs and my hands have been going numb. Uh, And uh, it's it's scary, it's weird, uh, but we're at that stage now where something has to be done. So I've been seeing some surgeons, I've had multiple MRIs, x-rays, and I just got a CT scan last Friday for them to try to figure out what's going on. 
Uh, I'm trying to be hopeful. Uh, they can figure something out. In the meantime, also discussed with a doctor who believes that uh, the stem cell treatment and surgery he can do for me, injecting stem cells uh, between my C1 to C7, and then also injecting stem cells into my brain stem, that it will help. And uh, so I'm actually, a friend of mine, Susan, is raising money for that because insurance doesn't cover it. And actually, I've just been tapped out with all the medical bills I've had to spend the last 10, 12 years. So we are almost there. Uh, the GoFundMe, Chris Fleming GoFundMe that Susan had launched for me, my good friend Susan Cummins, is going to end November 30th. Uh, we're just shy of the goal. It's going to cost me about twelve grand to get the stem cell treatment. Um, and we're at about seven grand right now. So anything you can do to help, I appreciate it. You know, I've been doing this podcast for 16 years for free. Uh, I've done a lot of stuff for free for people and helped raise over a million dollars uh, in the last 15 years for various charities. A lot of it with the darkness events and stuff I've done on my own uh, with uh, animal shelters and with um, certain charities. So I hate to ask for anything, but if you could pitch in and stuff like that and that would be great. Then I can go get this uh, stem cell treatment and therapy in January and February. So that's it. I normally don't ask for stuff and sell stuff on this podcast, but uh, it's something I'm going to be doing in the future to let you know, guys know, because I also plan to redo my website. And I know some of you have been saying that, hey, your website's down or you know, someone hacked it. No, it's just GoDaddy raised the prices for the certificates and it's just, it's too expensive um, to keep the website going. So I'm shifting my website to Wix. I just haven't completed it yet. I hope to have that done by January or February, where you will also be able to see any appearances, multimedia content, articles, and a lot of fun stuff I hope to be doing on this website. And uh, once that's launched, I'll let you know. So there'll be some good things coming in 2023. Um, and some other things I don't want to talk about yet. We'll wait to see what's going on. So summary. Check out the Etsy store, Chris Fleming Artwork, and use the code BLACK20 for your 20% discount. And if you have the opportunity, click on the link for the GoFundMe from the Parent Planet Paranormal, as well as on my social media. And if you're able to, I don't like to ask people to do something they can't, or they don't want to do. Definitely understand that. We all have problems we're going through. But if you're able to donate, thank you. I truly appreciate it as the uh, GoFundMe ends November 30th. But this podcast is a part of my journey in finding healing, in finding solutions to get better. I was very fortunate with a friend of mine reached out to me because she knew that I wanted to go do ayahuasca. I wanted to try resetting the brain and hopefully eliminating the pain receptors in my body and getting it to heal. And she told me about a friend of hers that was going to a retreat dealing with plant medicine. And I said, oh my God, let's go. The universe is answering my prayer. So I went with my friend Guri, and I flew out to Nevada, and we drove to this location. And I got to meet Linnell from Plants Maestras. And uh, she's going to join us on this episode. Now, I recorded this about two months ago. I just haven't had a chance to, to upload it and play it for you guys. But she's going to discuss with us the amazing depths of experience to plant medicine. So what is plant medicine? Before I play for you the phone call with her discussing this, what is plant medicine? Well, to quote from Psychedelic Times, an article published February 25th, 2016, which I will have a link to the full article on this podcast post on Planet Paranormal as well. This article informs when people talk about plant medicine in a psychedelic context, they're referring to plants like cannabis. Silbicidin, such as magic mushrooms, B. Capri, Chacruna, and, you know, of course, Amazon brew, ayahuasca. When smoked or ingested, these plants have psychedelic properties that take their imbibers, whatever that means, on transformational inner journeys of self reflection and profound consciousness expansion that can change someone's lives in a highly positive way. While milder psychedelics such as cannabis can be used recreationally, stronger plant-based psychedelics like ayahuasca or ibogaine are anything but recreational, often involving highly unpleasant physical side effects such as nausea and vomiting, often referred to as purging. 
but intense psychological distress or ego death during certain parts of the trip. What does that mean? Well, you're getting rid of certain trauma and stuff that you've been dealing with your whole life. For some people, it might be unpleasant. For other people, it's very rewarding. According to the article, these plants are highly valued because of the therapeutic benefit that comes from these experiences, as well as the blissful and revelatory moments that often follow. It is incredibly transformative and often ranks as one of the most important spiritual experiences of a person's life. Ancient and indigenous cultures around the world often held their locally available psychedelic plant medicines at the very core of their society, considering them sacred and essential. Today, we are beginning to understand through science and clinical research just how powerful these medicines can be in the face of some of our most serious and hard-to-treat psychological conditions. Plant medicines such as ayahuasca, psilocybin, cannabis, and ibogaine have shown huge promise in treating conditions like post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, opiate addiction, nicotine addiction, alcoholism, anxiety, and depression. It's incredible to realize that when utilized correctly, these psychedelic plants often prove to be safer and more effective than the conventional treatments and prescription medications that modern science offers. It makes you consider that perhaps these primitive pre-industrial cultures that valued plant medicine so highly were not so primitive at all. As unique and valuable as the psycho-spiritual aspects of psychedelic plant medicines are, we are beginning to see more and more that there are many physiological healing effects as well. Cannabis is a great example as it's the most widely studied of all the psychedelics. An incredible amount of physical healing benefits have been attributed to cannabis through scientific research. The conditions that cannabis has been shown to help treat are too numerous to list, ranging from glaucoma, appetite loss, to pediatric epilepsy and cancer. Last year, the U.S. Department of Health stated that cannabis kills cancer cells, despite it being listed as a Schedule One drug with no health benefits. Cannabis has been used by humans since antiquity, and it's very encouraging to see that science is vindicating its safety and health benefits which helps to overcome the strong stigma that was attached to it ever since the reefer madness days. The stronger psychedelic plant medicines also show signs of catalyzing physical and neurological healing. Both ibogaine and psilocybin have been shown to initiate neurogenesis, or the growth of new brain cells, which is a vitally important function of brain development in children, but far less common in adults. While our understanding of the significance of neurogenesis in adult brains is still rudimentary, it seems to point yet again to there being a scientific and physiological basis for the incredible brain rewiring that both ancient cultures and modern advocates attribute to transformative psychedelic experiences. Now you can read more about this article. I will have the link on the Planet Paranormal page right after the podcast, but I found it found it very informative because I was looking for a solution after my head injury and also my neck injury. If you were to listen to my podcast before my car accident, uh, which was in September 2009, and listen to my speech now, although it may be very subtle, you'll notice a little bit of slurring. That's because of the neck and brain injury. As well, sometimes I'll suffer from aphasia and cervical dystonia where I will mess up words or forget certain things. That happens. That's why I edit this podcast. And it tends to normally occur when I have more pain. When I don't have any pain, I'm fine. (laughs) And that's just the distortion and blockage that goes on from the brain to the rest of the body. It causes those little gaps. And I know there's a lot of people out there that have far worse or similar. So I thought it would be great to do this podcast and bring Linnell on to share with us the journey she's been going through, as well as share with you the journey that I went through. Now, this did not heal my neck, but it did identify the areas of my neck. It actually stirred up my creativity, which made me get back into art, which when you hear my story and what she states about the plant medicine, you'll understand. So let's get to the podcast. We'll be right back with the interview with Linnell and plant medicine.
Hello, hello, hello. Hi, Chris. Hello, hello. How are you doing? I can see clearly now the rain is gone. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and look at that. There's a plant behind you. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of plants in here. I should I should have thought I, didn't, I wasn't sure if we, we could have probably like positioned it to like we have this like beautiful like ayahuasca piece right here. Oh, that's nice. Wow. Like our <laughs> Look at the flower of life just below it. Yeah. It's, oh, yeah. It's so pretty. Yeah. So how have you been? I'm doing good. I'm doing really good. How are you? I'm good. You're traveling all over. You're just in Costa Rica, huh? Yeah. We just got back from Costa Rica. And then we had, we drove to Oregon up in the Bend area. And then from Bend, we just finished a session up in Washington two days ago. And Joe back down, and we have a session this weekend in Los Angeles. So, oh, that's fantastic! How yeah. exciting! And then we're going to be up in where we met up in Utah next weekend. Utah, oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I definitely want to come back. Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've got, I've got some questions for you. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> this was my first experience. Okay, doing plant medicine. Mm -hmm. And obviously, my listeners are, are not that familiar with it. Some are, but mo most aren't. For those that don't know, mm -hmm. you know, what is plant medicine? Yeah, so plant medicine, it really could be. Uh, there's a variety of things. You know, there's so many different types of plant medicines that are out there. Um, you know, I think what a lot of people are most familiar with, with plant medicines, it could be working with an apothecary, um, which would be uh, tinctures, which could be like euchanasia. Um, you know, they, these are things that that they've used in through traditions to help, you know, keep us healthy and keep us strong. Um, and then as we get a little bit deeper into like our consciousness, um, it could be things like cannabis, uh, which we use, we call Santa Maria in a Brazilian uh, terms, or it could be um, a lot of people use like magic mm -hmm. mushrooms, which a lot of people might be familiar with, with psilocybin. Um, and then what I work with, the medicine that I carry is ayahuasca, which is the uh, combination of uh, the ayahuasca vine and chacunda with water together to, to, to bring on that medicine. But also tobacco, it's, it's a plant medicine um, when used uh, with, with reverence and with intention and when it's in its pure form, right? Because like tobacco that we use here in the West is very confluted with a lot of chemicals and it's lost its spirit, essentially. Um, plant medicine is, is, is the spirit of the plants that we're working with, uh, internally with reverence. So, and I know it goes back to many different cultures, right? Cause I know like Indians would do peyote and stuff like that to connect with spirits. I mean, it, in your research and your experience with this, what, was there any particular cultures or history that impresses you regarding the use of plant medicine? Oh, all of them. Every, every one. I find medicine in all of them. Um, even, you know, when we work with like, uh, you know, the practice that we are closest with is the Santo Daimi practice, which is a Brazilian practice. Um, I do have a lot of knowledge uh, with Shipibo practice as well, which is so beautiful. Uh, and Colombians with the Yahe, uh, it's like the ayahuasca, they call it the Yahe, which is Y-A-G-E. Um, but yeah, it's, it, and, but every type of uh, like culture, they have their own tradition and their own way of carrying the medicines. And so uh, the way I love to look at it is like someone like me who doesn't come from a, a huge long lineage of like these shamans that are passed down from great grandfathers, you know, I'm here in the West working with the medicine. And so I like to look at it as like, I have my begging bowl, like a monk and I go to these spaces and I learn and I find teachers and I, I really emerge myself into the practice and learn and be a part of the practice. And then I take the things that I think I can, that resonate deeply with me and I recreate them in my spaces. And I bring, uh, when I bring the medicine and people to the medicine. Well, that's wonderful. I mean, when, when you talk about your space and, and obviously your own self discovery, you know, what is it that led you to pursuing this? plant medicine and the rituals so i think my initial my initial pull to the medicine was my my own personal story uh with my grandmother um my grandmother i was her i became her caretaker um and she was diagnosed with alzheimer's mm -hmm. and she went through years of forgetting everything and she passed away and i was really at this place of like um 
where is this God of this woman who, who sacrificed her whole life for her family? And what is this world in this life? And she can't even remember, you know, that she, that she gave birth to a daughter and that she was married for 52 years and that she has grandchildren, you know, why, why would a God or why would this world create like such heartache and suffering for somebody? And, um, I had a friend who referred me to a teacher. His name is Alfonso de Rose. And uh, they said, you, you should, you should go to one of these sessions. You know, I was in a deep depression. I was severely sad. I was um, kind of turning away from like anything religious. And I was just, I was in a really dark, deep place. And then um, I went to this session with Alfonso. It was my first session. And I had this huge uh, process with my grandmother and she, uh, I was able to connect with her and, and be with her. And she was able to give me these insights and a lot of closure of what I needed. And um, I, I was able to to start to pray again and, and, and to feel my connection to source and spirit. And from there, I just, I, I realized that this was something I was starving for. Yeah. My soul was starving for this. And I knew that this is something that so many of us are so hungry for this connection, this, um, this, the, it, it just seeing, it just knowing, just this knowing that we know is there, but we just don't know it's there, if that makes sense. Yeah. And then it comes through and then we, we feel the connection and we, um, I started following him everywhere. I went to Costa Rica. We went to, I did dietas with the plants. We went to Peru. I went to, I went everywhere I could go, uh, and just started eating it up and it became like my, uh, it was my path, you know, where I am now. Thank you for sharing that. You know, obviously connection and path is important. You know, whether that's to heal and then be able to move forward to find your major definite purpose or both part of the healing process is helping you reach your major definite purpose. I know when I went to one of your events and I had my own personal reasons, reasons for going, which was basically my car accident, my neck, my head, trying to reset the brain as well as trying to reconnect with spirit, though I've had extraordinary experiences and um, we might talk, touch on that briefly. And I remember just sitting around seeing all these other people with obviously different backgrounds and different things that they're going through. And I was just like, wow, we're all, we're all vulnerable. Yeah. And we're all connected in a way, just in varying degrees. And I mean, there was, there was so much love that was around the room and everybody's like there, you know, and, and the one thing that I remember is because obviously I got sick the first night, <laughs> you know, with, with the, uh, I don't even know what that was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the mistake I made was, and I remember a couple of individuals saying, whatever you do, don't swallow it. I said, okay. So, you know, it's in my nasal passage and everything. And I lay down and then I feel the post nasal drip instead of coughing it up and, and blowing it up, I swallowed it. <laughs> and, and I, I remember when I had tried chewing tobacco many years ago and I swallowed it and it was that same type of feeling nauseated. Yeah. Same thing, you know, yeah. it's not meant to be in the stomach. <laughs> so, yeah, I remember you like turned white, you were like as white as a ghost. I was like, let's get some electrolytes in him. <laughs> right. And, and I just remember, I, I said, oh my God, this is now how I want to go. I was feeling so sick. And then I started worrying. I started panicking because I felt vulnerable spiritually. And I remember my dad uh, appearing on my dad shows himself, comes right to me, says, son, listen to me. He goes, this is not going to happen the second night. And mm -hmm. you need to see something because then I'm worried, is there a negative entity is going to come down this and that? Because I do deal with this stuff in my work. And all of a sudden mm -hmm. I see all these angels all around us and these other souls, which I believe were relatives of the people that were there that were facing outward. And as they were facing mm -hmm. outward, they were all together in a group side by side, protecting all of us from any mm -hmm. negative influence. And, and as I perceived this and saw this, not only was I in awe, but I was like, Oh my God, we're all protected. It's okay. Yeah. So I can yeah. I can relax and just allow this to pass and not have to worry feeling that I'm so vulnerable. And I remember when you had your staff that was so kind, they said, you know, you're not feeling well here. Do you want to go sit in a chair? And I remember putting my hands on their shoulders and then someone putting their, their hands on my back. And I felt like so protected. I felt so trust. And I said, okay, I'm learning trust right now. This is a sense of where I feel vulnerable, but I'm in such a safe space that not only did I see spiritually, but also with these individuals that I could feel how sincere they are, that I can just be guided by them. And I remember sitting down in the chair, I said, everything's going to be okay. 
you know? Yeah. And then of course I had a few other experiences here and there, but for me that, that said, all right, this is great. This is really, mm -hmm. really special. Yeah. So, you know, for people listening, you know, obviously you travel all over, you go to some amazing places and you meet all kinds of people mm -hmm. is what, how do I say this question? Most people come there for what reasons or, 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 or try plant medicine? What are they searching for? What are they looking for? You know, it's, uh, we get so many different, I've, I've had the most incredible people come. Some people come because they don't even know what they're coming for, but they know that they're being called right. for some reason. Something's calling them. Um, they've heard it maybe, or they've seen it somewhere and then they just couldn't get it out of their mind. I have other people that are, that come because they have childhood trauma. Um, you know, I, we have a lot of, I mean, most of our traumas come from a lot of childhood trauma, the way we love, the way we the view the world, our experiences and the way we move through our relationships are all based off of our childhood trauma and our relationship with our parents. Right. So mm -hmm. healing, healing these traumas, we have a lot of people that come uh, because of uh, sexual trauma that's happened, you know, uh, at various times in their life. Right. We have people that come for self-worth issues because they, for some reason or another, they don't feel worthy of love. They don't feel worthy of um, all the gifts that spirit wants to present to them. Right. And this is creating a, um, it's, it's creating a barrier for them to receive the love, you know, because they haven't worked through that. Um, we've had people, uh, that are on the spectrum that sit in our spaces that it's been a very extraordinary process of learning how to work with autistic people in these medicine spaces. It's really beautiful. Um, we, uh, yeah. We have people that we have people that are deaf. We have people that are blind. We have people that we have a quadriplegic. We have a paraplegics that come. We have so many different kinds of people that come to the spaces, um, and all of them are looking for different things. Some of them are looking for clarity. Some of them are looking to heal. You know, um, heartbreak. You know, heartbreak is a big one of the big ones. You know, right. from love, uh, our heart is so tender, and uh, learning how to move through that in a good way so that we can create more love for ourselves in the future. It's also a big process for people. So, um, uh, finding, you know, people coming after divorce, you know, divorce is the big thing that we work, right. that we are, that we are here in the West. Um, and it is very traumatizing, you know, for, for people when they're navigating that. So there's so many different reasons and varieties of reasons why people come to this space. Um, there isn't, I couldn't really pinpoint, but a lot of, I do have a lot of people that come for trauma, you know, uh, PTSD. We have a lot of veterans that sit with me, um, for military that, that work through a lot of that as well. I think we all have things that we have to work through, which is one of the big reasons why these events are successful and people go to them. And the reason why you put these things on, I mean, that's what brought me there. And if, if I can be transparent with my listeners, because I do like to share personal things with my listeners, I, I want to share with them my journey, why I went, what I went through in this podcast, along with what you're sharing so they get an idea. I'm not just someone that's interviewing you and has no idea about it. I went to one of your events. And the important thing is, what is your intent? Why are you doing this? What do you want to get out of this? For me, my main reason was to see if I could you know, heal the brain because um, I have a really bad neck injury and I had a TBI from a car accident 10 years ago. And, and I'll get into the reason what led me to pursue that in a second. That was one of the things. The other one was like, okay, what kind of spiritual experience can I have? Because I've had some incredible out of conscious, out of body consciousness type experiences with cannabis oil. Mm -hmm. And I actually had those experiences by mistake. I took too much mm -hmm. and I witnessed extraordinary things. Then I've had some out of body experiences due to me stop breathing and leaving my body. So I thought, okay, I'd like to have one of those experiences. Yeah. The only thing I had was, you know, as, as I shared with you, my father and seeing these angels, and then I saw my cats you know, I saw the cats that had passed away. I saw them briefly on different layers within heaven. I was like, oh my God. And they had told me that you're going to have some problems with your cat Noir and his time's going to be short. And ironically, you know, because we did this event, I think the end of January, beginning of February. Yeah. I think, yeah. You taught me usually in February in that area. So yeah. Yeah. The beginning of March, my uh, one cat started collapsing, having a heart condition. He would collapse 14 times wow. a day where his heart would completely stop. And that was probably the most stressful thing I've gone through all year. Um, and he's on medication now that's basically just keeping him alive until everything shuts down. So there was a prophetic vision that occurred there with the cats and them telling me that 
this is going to be coming with noir. And I'm like, what? And it happened. So to me, that was extraordinary. But I remember two yeah. situations that occurred. One of them, they said, okay, I said, okay, I want to leave my body and I want to go to heaven and I want to go see my spirit guides and I'm going to go see this. And they're like, why? Like, what do you mean? Why? They're like, Chris, you've already done this and you do this occasionally. Why do you want to do it now? I said, well, why not? Yeah. And I said, he goes, think about all these other people that don't get to experience those experiences. And here you are wanting to do that. There's other things you need to work on right now. I said, okay. So then I said, all right, well, you know, I, do I have all this baggage inside of me from past relationships? I've had some really bad relationships. And the last one from last year was probably one of the worst because there was a child involved where her Mm -hmm. daughter and I fell in love with her daughter and I wanted to be the parent, the father. And I was led to believe that I was going to be that. Mm -hmm. So the hardest thing from that breakup was I was so close to having a family. Yeah. And so close. And this, this, this little girl adored me and she's like, I love you. And I love you too. And she's like, Oh, we're a family now. And it was just one of those things that just tore in my heartstrings. And all of a sudden the plant was showing me that. And it was saying, Chris, it wasn't about her. It was about you with this child to understand, you know, what it's like to have a child and, and to be there for, even though it was temporary, we wanted you to see this, that it's okay to be in a relationship with someone else's child even though it's not your child and you can still love that child as if it's your own. And they showed that to me and I started bawling for like about two minutes and I had to get that out. Mm -hmm. And they said, that's what that relationship was all about. I'm like, wow, yeah, really nothing to do with her. And then they showed me briefly her that she has a lot of evolution to go through spiritually. And then we moved on to the next thing. And that was a span of maybe, you know, you you can't gauge time when you're under the plant medicine, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know? But for me, it was like, right? Yeah. So it seemed like it was maybe 10 minutes, but God only knows how long it was. Yeah. So I found that amazing that it's, because I remember you saying during the session, you're like, you know, listen to what the plant medicine says, where it takes you. Mm -hmm. And then I started feeling this trickling in the back of my neck around the C1 area down to about the C5. That is the area that's been damaged. But I actually felt this... I don't even know how to describe it. It was like a tingling sensation, but as if it was alive, like something was moving in that area. And at Mm -hmm. first I thought, oh, I'm getting healed, Mm -hmm. but it was actually showing me exactly where the damage was. And that's what I was experiencing. And to me, I'm sitting there going, oh my God, just, just go with it. Allow it to show you. And it showed me where all the damage was. So then we started focusing on that with my doctors and we came to realize that, you know, this is where we need to have surgery. So, you know, those things, those elements were extraordinary from my own personal experience, which mm-hmm. later on I'll, I'll, I'll get into more detail with some of the listeners. But for you, that's what I had got out of it. And then my attention kind of turned towards watching other people go through that shaping, that experiencing, that self-love, that healing and even encountering like the one girl encountered her mother and I saw her mother standing right behind her. Yeah. Like, oh my God, her mother's right behind her, you know? And so it was extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, um, I love to tell people because it's like you go in and like you said, Chris, you're like, Oh, I want to see, I want to see the angels. I want to transcend into heaven. Yeah. It's right. uh, the best thing that I love sharing with people. It's the 20, 80 rule, right? It's 20% of what you want. It's 80% of what you need. So there was other things that you needed um, that she brought to you. And also, I, I also like to always remind people that it's um, like your experience with with the healing, right? So you're the showing you where the healing need to occur for the surgery. This is a this is a very beautiful phenomenon. And um, but I always like to remind people that this is like your these this is that that phenomenon is a result of your own personal deep prayers of your own personal deep connection with your spirit, your own connection with source and reminding people that, yeah, that this medicine helps give us the opportunity to find that. But it is actually you. That's that's the power. That's that's the that's mm-hmm. the guide in there and your guides around you. And um, a, a big part of this practice is to kind of make sure that, you know, there's there's a lot of. Um, fluffy 
fluffy energy that rolls around with like shamans and and gurus and this type of energy. And I really try to remind people that um, although I do have a lot of reverence for the plant medicine, that it isn't me that's that's like that's in charge of the healing or that's giving you the healing, that it's actually yourself and your own relationship right. with source and and your relationship with these plants as well. And your process can never be recreated inside anybody else again. Um, this is so unique and and your connection. Um, so it's like some people are we have people that get really phenomenal things things like, with like hearing and walking and all this stuff. And I would say that is, that is all you, like, this is your deep prayers and your, your, your connection with source that creates this, um, these types of healings that come up. Yeah. You know, when you, you talk about healing is when you, you've worked with doctors, physicians, you've gone through therapies and I had gone through over 10 years and, and not finding any solutions. And, and some doctors saying, you know, I, I can't operate on you. I'm afraid if I do, it's there's other so much other stuff going on. It's it's not going to help you. It could make it worse. Yeah. So I was at wit's end. So mm-hmm. I had been looking to art alternative, you know, methods. Mm-hmm. You know, and this was one of them. And I and I remember over a year ago, a year or two ago, a friend of mine sent me a video. Uh, it was an interview with Brian Gumble and Daniel Carcillo. Daniel mm-hmm. Carcillo was a Canadian hockey player. He also played for Chicago Blackhawks, who my dad played for. Mm-hmm. And Carcillo had suffered many concussions. Yeah. And he went into depression, manic depression, and he was becoming suicidal because mm-hmm. of the damage to his brain from, you know, early stages of CTE. So mm-hmm. uh, for a last hope, he went to Peru, I believe it was, mm-hmm. and he went and did ayahuasca. Mm-hmm. Now, this interview shows him going and doing it and talking about it. And when I hear him, when I watched the video, my spice says, you need to watch this. So I watched it. And when I heard him talking about his symptoms, which were identical to mine, I lost it emotionally. I just broke down because I could relate to what he's saying. And I said, I have to go do this. So I was going to try to go overseas to do it, you know, to Peru or wherever. And then we got hit with COVID and everything else. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, this is terrible. And then as universe has it, I, I came across, I was given your name and uh, through another friend friend. And I said, Oh my God, let's go do it. As soon as I get back from Scotland, I want to go do this. Mm-hmm. So what's amazing is that, you know, Dennis Carcillo is starting a company called Wasana Health that is using psilocybin. You know, mm-hmm. Mike Tyson had invested in other people and they're just waiting for the FDA approval where they're going to be using psychedelic medicine for mental health care and to help people with concussions. Now that just shows you right there yeah. The benefits that now science and medicine is adopting this and going to be using this. This isn't the, you know, just the old dark shaman in the back and you're like, oh my God, what's going to happen? There's going to be demons. There's going to be this. There's going to be that. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's not that scary stuff or the, the LSD trips, right? Exactly. There's so many, there's so many clinical studies that are out now on this, that, that are showing, uh, the, the, the impact that these plants have on our psyche, on our bodies, on our, on, you know, and when all of our, when our physical, emotional, spiritual, all of this is in line in harmony, we start to heal. We start to feel good. We start to talk. We start to talk lovely to ourselves in our mind, right? Mm -hmm. We start to have lovely thoughts. And when we start to eradicate all this negative energy on all these levels of us, we start to just feel better. We start to have more gratitude for our days when we wake up. We start to water our plants. We start to like brush our hair. <laughs> These little things sometimes are like a lot. Like, you know, when you're in a depression, you know, sometimes, you know, if especially if you've had, you know, this car accident, sometimes getting out of bed and getting in the shower takes all the energy in the world, right? Right. And it's always important to have a positive mental attitude. But physical pain is physical pain. And looking for solutions is always, you know, the top of someone's mind when you're dealing with this pain. But now we have some solutions that, you know, I'm raising money to pursue so I can get these stem cells in my neck. But now my doctor says, no, we need to remove some bones in your neck. Uh, The severe stenosis because they're pressing on the nerves and the blood vessels, which now we know why is causing the fatigue. So yeah. I'm excited, like, oh my God, yes, finally. Well, my doctor's like, you're at stage four. You don't want to be at stage three or two. Stage yeah. one is basically death. Yeah. So he's like, you're at stage four. You need to have this done. How beautiful. It's what hope does. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. Now I got, yeah, got that hope, but it was funny is because the plan manager showed me those areas. So when I got home, I started looking at the MRIs and x-rays and one of my other doctors said, we need to focus on this. I'm telling you, they're telling me it's all right here. Yeah. So I started doing more research and then my doctor's like, you know what? I think you're right. That led us to where now 
I just got to find the surgeon that takes my insurance <laughs> to do the surgery. <laughs> then I get the stem cells after. So yeah. just for people, it, it, it might not be a solution for you, but it leads you down that path and journey. At least it has done for me to, to find the hope and, and to continue pursuing. Yeah. You're opening up the right? book. Like the book is open now. Now you get to start reading it and going through it. And, um, these I love these spaces as well because it really does it brings people in and they they listen and they hear and they learn not only yeah from the plant medicines but we are we're in a classroom for like a full weekend right it is a full classroom of people and uh, how beautiful our perspectives change just by listening to other people go through their journey and 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 and, and relating to them uh, finding compassion finding empathy and uh, and sometimes at the same time finding gratitude for our own life you know like wow like my my, my life, I am, I have so much gratitude for my life. There's a lot of suffering in it, but it, it, there could be a lot more, you know, there's a lot of things I have to be grateful for. So yeah, I remember hearing some people's stories and I started crying <laughs> when we were there in Utah. I'm just crying going, Oh my God, you know, you know, their, their life's been tough, yeah. you know, and they're going through a hard time. And, you know, some of us could relate because we've been through those things they're going through and, yeah. but we've gotten through it. And so we could relate. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. I mean, you deal with people all over, which obviously, as we're discussing here, varying degrees of mental and physical states. Mm -hmm. Now, plant medicine also considered mind altering plants, but some people get a negative towards that mind altering. But as we're seeing here, medicine and mental health it's helping these depressions. It's helping these fragmentations of the brain from concussions that resets the brain. Can you tell us a little bit about how the plants helping people with their mental states? Yeah. I mean, like a lot, like one of the biggest, um, one of the biggest challenges that I work through with a lot of people is depression. It's something that mm -hmm. I feel a lot of people have experienced on varying degrees, um, you know, severe depression, light depression, and ultimately what that is, uh, that could be a lot of things on a lot of levels, but a lot of people resort to Western medicine and they get onto an antidepressant like uh, Zoloft or Wellbutrin. And this is how they maintain their depression. Um, and it kind of keeps everything like, a, you know, they're not feeling. I, and and I, I also don't want to uh, take away from the benefits of these medicines. You know, if we need them to help get us in a, if there's a lot of trauma that's happening and we need to, we need it as a crutch to be here and be present and not to um, go into those deep places. I, I recommend them for people, but um, what it is, is these plant medicines are also all those chemicals that we get in, in the pharmaceutical industry. We have them in the plant medicines, the, the dopamine, the serotonin, the oxytocin, the, and, and when we do a ceremony, you know, this, it fills up all these capacities and it also gives us a paradigm shift. Um, so a lot of people who do years and years of therapy, um, they'll come to a medicine ceremony and there's people that have kind of compared uh, a weekend with these plants, uh, something along the same lines of like, you know, five to six to 10 years of therapy. So if, if people who've done therapy, mental health therapy, talking to a therapist to work through trauma, this kind of um, is like the, the hyper zones in right in on it because these plants, the technology, the plants and the way they work, it's, um, it's different with each person and right. they communicate with, a, in a way that, that is very particular just to you. Um, and, and so I can tell you every single day, how beautiful and how special you are, Chris, and how much you mean in this world. And it may not resonate with you in a particular way, just because this is a, a repetitive or the way it is, or you think maybe this is what she's supposed to be saying, but the way the plants communicate with you and the way they tell you how valuable you are, um, it's a completely different way. And, and you yeah. don't fully understand it until you experience it. And you're like, Oh my God, I can't believe this is how she expressed it to me. And now I get it. Um, and that's, right. that's like how special the the way they talk to you is like they always say is like mother talking to you or what what is what is she saying to you and what it is it is a conversation that's happening yeah but you feel it too though mm -hmm. i mean you feel it in your soul yeah and you feel it on a higher level of understanding that it's truth yeah and you can't argue with mm -hmm. it you know and you wouldn't want to argue with it you're just like okay Oh, I understand. Yeah. Like a, like a greater, you know, infinite intelligence or collective consciousness yeah. that's speaking to you. Yeah, it's so beautiful. What are some of the most amazing experiences that you've had or a story that you can share with us from someone else, if that's okay? Let's see. Um, a story that I can share. 
It's a good question. Let's see. Uh, there's so many of them. <laughs> Let me look back at this. Right, right. Yeah. So like we, uh, for example, like we had this past weekend, um, we had a couple in the ceremony um, and they realize and recognize, and I don't know how many people believe this or what this is as well, because it's always some, I know a lot of people who are, who could be tuning in or not, but the understanding of like twin flames and soulmates and, and lovers and all of this and what this is in the astrals, right? But they, they recognize that they were twin flames, right? And right. Uh, they talked about their higher selves, right? And their higher self essentially was the version of the other person. So they were male and female. So, uh, when the one, when the one woman was talking about her higher self, she said, my higher self came in as a man. And then her twin flame who was in the ceremony said his higher self came in as a woman. And he went through this whole experience of having caring children and, and, and birthing a child, essentially going through contractions and feeling, feeling labor pains and actually experiencing giving birth from, from a male perspective, having his higher self be a woman and, and their higher selves are essentially birthing a new version of them together, the twin souls. So it was such wow. a powerful like process listening to them and how they navigated it. And simultaneously the same time in the same ceremony, just different perspectives, but the same story intertwined with each other. That's such a beautiful thing. Yeah. And it could show how two people are connected, but then also, certain individuals can show them self love, yeah, how they their higher self loves them, mm-hmm. and they realize they're such more they're much more than this physical body, plus there's so much more, yeah. yeah, and there's so much more than the trauma that they've been through, yeah. Um, and I also think like other stories, some of my favorite stories and some, and another thing that we work with the most in this space is our addiction. Mm. Um, you know, people have substance who have, you know, they. Um, addiction is such a tender space to be and understanding addiction and um, having addiction in my own family and knowing like how much it hurts everybody around wow. them. Right. Um, and how out of control people can feel with addiction. So I have a lot of amazing stories of people coming off of heroin um, and, and, and staying off of it. You know, the, the statistics for, for people who go into rehab with heroin, for example, is like three to 5%. Wow. Um, and, and these rehabs cost thousands of dollars, 45, 50, a hundred thousand dollars that go into rehab. And it's, it's far and few, uh, 4% that people are going to be promised to stay sober. That's a really bad business plan. That's terrible. You know, if you really think about it, like statistically. So, um, but it is, it's, it's not just the, the ceremony and the plant medicine that is responsible for that healing, right? It's the, the prayers and it's the consistency and it's the, creating the support system around you and reaching out when you need help. It's developing tools, right? We have to develop our, I always like to teach people, we have to develop our tool bag. Right. Yes. The ceremony and this, this space is going to bring profound healing, but how are we going to, and here's the magic word, integrate this into the outside world. So integration, that's the actual work. How are we going to bring what we're learned in here into the real world so that this is actually beneficial to us? And it wasn't just a, trip or a journey, you know, that we are integrating this, this process into the world and into our families and into our workspaces and into our decision-making. Um, this is the, the, the hardest part of all of the work essentially. Makes sense. You know, how are we going to integrate this when we learn something, when we're offered a solution, when there's a plan in front of us, you know, what are we going to do about it? You know, some people follow it and they get resolved and they get healed and some people don't. There's a friend of mine that. Um, He's the one that sent me the video, actually. He's an alcoholic, and he's been wanting Mm -hmm. to go, and he had a trip to go to Peru Mm -hmm. to go do it, and then COVID hit, and he didn't go, and he was going to go another time, Mm -hmm. and some people went, but they got stuck there, and he's glad he didn't go. So I don't know if he's gone yet or not. I haven't spoke to him about it, but I know he needs to because uh, he's destroyed Mm -hmm. so much in his life because of this addiction. And I had looked up... uh, some statistics in regarding says, is ayahuasca good for depression? And it's, and I don't know exactly where this was from, but it says participants reporting depression or anxiety at the time of consuming ayahuasca, 78% reported that their depression was either very much improved. Um, 
which is like 46%, or completely resolved, 32%. While 70% of those with anxiety report that their symptoms were very much improved, 54% or completely. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. You were just saying four or 5% when you're dealing with addictions, but you know, a lot of addictions are caused by depression and (laughs) more than half, you know, has improved. Yeah. It's incredible. It's, it's, and I think even from that session, there was a couple of people there that have incredible addiction stories um, uh, in that particular space that I know of personally that plant medicines have changed their life. Um, And they continue, you know, they continue, they drink, they drink the set, they, they come to ceremonies regularly, um, maybe once every six months or so. Everybody has a different, a different flow of, of how, of what they look for. I have a person he once told me, um, every day I do something special for myself and every week I do one thing special just for me. Every six months I do something special just for me. And his six month thing that he does just for him is he attends one of these retreats and he goes and it's his time to check out. It's his time to tune into source and kind of, kind of clean his slate, you know, put his intentions in, make sure he gets recalibrated, make sure he's on, he's on focus. So it does become, you know, or once a year, once every five years, every, you know, every 10 year anniversary or whatever it is. Um, and, and there's, there's a lot of medicine practitioners out there, you know, is, 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 is eerie as we think it is, or, or hard it is to find it. You know, once you put the intention out into the universe to find the connection, there are a lot of well-qualified, beautiful medicine practitioners out there. And I think that's the biggest right. part is finding someone that has really reliable medicine that works directly with a teacher that gives back to the tribes, the medicine's coming from and holds a very um, reputable space, essentially. I'm glad you said that because at the time when I was, I was doing research to find out where to go, was I going to go to Costa Rica? Was I going to go to Peru? And then some friends says, well, you know, there's, there's a place in Chicago, whatever. Well, Chicago one's not doing it anymore. And then there's a place in Kentucky and there's other places. So I started doing research on a lot of these and I was, some of them, I was extremely disappointed. I'm like, oh my God, there's no way I'm going there. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> the reviews and, and stuff is just horrible. And I'm, so then I was getting so confused because I was spending so much time on it. Yeah. And then my friend Guri's like, hey. Uh, a friend of mine's basically saying that, you know, they're going to go do plant medicine and stuff. Do, do you want to go? I go, what? Yeah. I was just saying to the universe, I can't decide. I need help. <laughs> and all of a sudden you call me this week, that same week I put it in the universe. Hell yeah. I'm going, when can we go? She goes, well, when do you want to go? As soon as possible. <laughs> <You're not laughs> I, go, Seriously, I just got back from Scotland. I go as soon as possible. She goes, all right, well, I'll find out. Well, there's going to be one, you know, the end of January, February. I said, let's go. Seriously. Yeah. I'll book the flights. Just tell me what we got to do. Yeah. And I was, I was on that thing. <laughs> I was on yeah, it. I'm like, was, we're going. Yeah. That was, I think that was my opening, one of my opening sessions too, for the year. So, um, but yeah, it's so beautiful. And, and this is the power of prayer, the power of manifestation, the power of like, when you want something, put it out there and it'll come like, and I always tell people there's so many, cause it's like my, I have my space and I carry my medicine, you know, uh, in the way that I do. And it doesn't always resonate with everybody and that's okay. Find a space that right. does, you know, there's so many different spaces out there. Talk about the space. You say space and I love you. I'm glad you brought that up. Cause I've been wanting mm-hmm. to ask you that you use that a lot during the mm-hmm. ritual. And, and it might have different meaning, but when my listeners are listening and you say space, tell me about space. So the space is, I guess, like energetically, you know, um, I, it could be, I have all kinds of different spaces and actual physical spaces. But what I mean by the space is the energy that flows around there and, and my energy, the energy of the other facilitators that are there, the energy that we require for us collectively to do this type of journey, right? Because we do get a lot of, um, we're in a current, essentially. We all get into this current, we go up the mountain and come down the mountain together. So um, that's the kind of space that I'm talking about is how how it's held, you know, what's required of the participants, what's um, what's not required, safety, um, and, and those type of protocols for that type of safety that, that needs to be instilled in there. So that people, like you said, once you feel like you can trust the space, that's when you can be vulnerable to let the medicine penetrate and, and take you on the journey that you're intended to go on, essentially. So um, the space, the actual physical space varies. Sometimes we're outside. Sometimes we're inside. Sometimes we're, we rent um, big, beautiful spaces. Sometimes we rent smaller spaces. It, it just always varies where, where spirit's taking us on that. But the actual space is the energy energetically that we hold. Um, and some people are like, yeah, the space kind of wasn't in my vibration. And it could be the people. It could be, there's a lot of things that like, 
right. that how people feel. And that's okay. That's okay that people don't feel, feel right. that, but find a space that you do feel good in. And that I love to do, like when I talk to people and I go through kind of the consult process, I, I like to just, if I can kind of feel them a little apprehensive, I just say, Hey, when you get off the phone, sit at the edge of your bed and just see how you felt about this conversation in me. And if you feel, um, you feel good and it feels like this flow and, and it's guiding you, then, then, then this is good. But if for any reason it doesn't feel like something doesn't check out or you feel uncertain or you don't feel like you're going to be safe in my space, that's okay. Don't give up. Like another space is going to come and you're going to find that vibration that's going to resonate with your spirit. And I remember a lot of people, you know, have to get uh, in certain areas, people go on the couch, mm-hmm. the chair, or go outside or go wherever, and they, they get into a different environmental space to continue. Yeah. And I remember the first night, obviously, I was in that chair because I wasn't feeling well, and that became my space for the night. And I had some really good one-on-one experiences with the plant medicine. And then the second night, you know, there's people all around me. And, and I have to ask you this, because this is just extraordinary. It's like going into another realm another dimension. I only had this happen one other time when I took too much uh, edibles and uh, I went to bed. I remember I'm seeing this like kaleidoscope machinery, these repetitious. So what, what is this kaleidoscope industrial like valleys, caves of repetitive Mm -hmm. moving, rotating, grinding images, like another realm of creative consciousness that keeps changing and evolving and flowing like hills and valleys, like you're floating through like a Mm -hmm. Disney park, but you're sitting on a ride watching all 360 degrees up, down around you where this just moves and rotates with these repetitive colors and graphics and images. What is that place? I, yeah, I think you nailed, you said it in this, this repetitive world of creative consciousness that's coming through. Like that is exactly what it is. You know, we, I, it was funny because we were driving back from this last session and uh, my medicine partner, she would, she mentioned to me that something that bothers her sometimes is when she's like, I was hallucinating is the word that a lot of people use. I was hallucinating. And she says it bothers her a lot because these are visions that the medicine is, that they're they're showing you for a reason. And sometimes they don't make sense, right? right? Like you're like, why am I seeing giant spiders on the ceiling or whatever it is? Um, but these are, these are visions and they're very right. intentional um, and they do take time to process. You may not understand them in the moment. Um, and also if, if you're seeing things, also examining what are you putting into your subconscious? What are you watching on your television? What music are you listening to? What are you, what are you filtering through your subconscious? This could also be a reminder that we need to really be mindful about what's coming, what our intake is, right? Because it all comes up very prominent on the outside. Um, but these are visions. They're the visions. And to trust these visions, whatever they are, you know. And I we also have to go. This is a journey. This is a process that the medicine is taking us on. And from my understanding, just from my own experiences, Sometimes we need to cross th- certain thresholds in our the way our neural pathways connect to get to this next level of healing. And so things are reconnecting and all this all this mm. processing is happening and it feels a little chaotic at times. Um, a lot of the times it feels chaotic. So uh, there's a lot of people that are like, they're like, I just feel so, everything right, feels right. so crazy. And it's breathing, bringing ourselves back to our body and our present body to, to go through it. But our, our brain is very active and there's a lot of connecting and a lot of healing that's happening in that space. So yes, it may not make sense now. Um, and this is a big part of the medicine process is things that don't make sense immediately. They make sense weeks, days, months later. You think back and you're like, aha, uh-huh. that's why I was seeing that, or that makes sense now, or that is that is the insight. Now the pieces are coming together and the dots are being connected. See, it's just extraordinary. People, uh, if you haven't been through this experience, it's, it's kind of hard to really fathom and understand until you experience it yourself from your own perspective. And you go through stages of emotions or fears or whatever, and you relinquish that, and you just go into a connection that is just hard to discuss. I mean, I remember the the first night after I got sick, I went and did the ayahuasca and I didn't experience anything. And I was just like, okay, I, I felt it more on the previous plant where they showed me some stuff and that was it. But there was nothing dramatic or, or life-changing for me when I did the ayahuasca, except what I felt in my neck. That was it. So the second yeah. night, I remember my dad saying, the first night says, you know, the second night's going to be better. I said, okay. So I was kind of disappointed in the morning because I thought I would be able to heal and reset my brain. But I said, you know what? There's one more night. All right, let's do this. And I remember... I think I took the first and second and I wasn't feeling anything. I said, Oh no, am I one of those people that's immune to it? <laughs> and then you said, okay, let me give you a little bit more. And then, uh, I think it was the third time. And then I go and I sit down 
And I'm like, look, and everybody having experiences and I'm not, I'm like, gosh, darn it. I just, and then I looked and you had the candles going and I remember I was getting like kind of a headache and I think it was because I was sick the night before and the music seemed so loud. So I said to one of the, the teachers, I said, you know, is there any way we could turn the music down? He says, no, it's all part of the ritual. I'm like, oh, how can I think and relax if I got this pounding in my head? But then I said, okay, I'm just going to go with it. Right. Mm-hmm. And as I go with it, then all of a sudden I see these elementals dancing around the candles. I'm like, there's these little people dancing around the candles. <laughs> I said, oh my God. I closed my eyes. And I look, I said, oh my God, there they are. I'm entering into a different spectrum outside our visual spectrum. Mm-hmm. My consciousness is perceiving this. So I said, all right, here we go. This is a journey. So I said, I'm going to lay down now. I lay down and that's when the kaleidoscope started. And at first it started with typewriter keys that were just environment where they're rotating like the sea. And then I go into rep repetitive, like penguins and stuff. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is like Andy Warhol repetition with his paintings. And, and I said, Oh, this is amazing. (laughs) And then I'm just going with it. Right. And it just continued. Yeah. But I noticed, you know, like you talk about, you know, we, we talk about creative consciousness. This is a realm, I guess that just is in this space somewhere Yeah, that is all creativity and from all ideas and everything flows from, and it's ever changing and ever evolving. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what it was. And me being, you know, an artist from the past and and creative director and stuff like that, that it was showing me that life is all about creating. Yeah. And here's where you pull it from. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Oh my God, I want to come back to this place and visit again. Right. Because it, there's no such thing as no ideas, no concepts, and no creativity because it is ever flowing and, and constantly continuous. Yeah. And the biggest things that we run into, because I think I was running into some of my fears, and I would see these negative entities or negative imagery, such as there'd be this snake, and the snake would lunge at me. Mm-hmm. And just before it's about to strike, it would freeze, and I'd look at it, and it's completely frozen. And then it would turn into butterflies and fly away. Mm-hmm. And then I'd see this demonic entity lunge at me, freeze, and, and then all of a sudden it would solidify, crumble, turn into dirt, and all these beautiful flowers and everything would grow from it. Mm-hmm. And I was seeing everything that was negative was being turned into something beautiful. I love that. Mm-hmm. And then I remember, you know, everybody starts getting up because they've gone through their journeys and because I was a late bloomer. <laughs> And it took me the third or fourth time with the ayahuasca to actually have the fact I was still in it. And I remember my friend Gary Sam, she says, Hey, Chris, how's it going? I said, Hey, I'm still on my journey. Leave me alone. Yeah. Right? She goes, what are you experiencing? And she goes, I'm sorry. I go, no, no, it's okay. You, you can stay, you can stand right next to me. Cause you know, I trust you. And I like, I like your presence, but I'm still seeing, she says, what are you seeing? And then I think you remember I'm seeing this. And right now I start talking to, it. I start talking to this imagery. I go, there's a bear in front of me playing cards. <laughs> I go, what is a bear doing? He's looking at me. He's like, what do you have? I go, have, I don't even have any cards. And all of a sudden I got hard cards on my hand. He throws down a full house. And I look at these other animals playing cards with this bear. I said, I don't want to play cards. I don't like cards. So he gets up and they leave. Then I see this like centipede type alien creature that's huge. And he's got like these equipment on, like military equipment, like sci-fi, something out of a sci-fi pulp comic from the 50s. Like on a, on a different planet. And he leans over. I said, oh, my God, you're some aden- uh, interdimensional entity. You're real. Mm-hmm. I go, hi. <laughs> and then I'm like, how are you? You know? And normally anybody else would be terrified wanting to come out of this nightmare. But for me, it was like, oh, my God, I'm going into these other realms of existences. I'm like, hi, how are you? And then he starts to fade. And, you know, I slowly start coming out of it. I said, wow, that was incredible. Yeah. So. Every person has their own journey, right? Every person has their own journey, yeah. And there's people that also have like past life regressions. They 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 go back and they know where they were, you know, they were in the time of the pyramids, Egyptians. We have people that 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 they came from the pharaohs and the pharaohs and people that go back in the time of the burning of the witches. We have aliens wow. in the space, you know, like people who are like, you know, I know this is I had this girl at one of these last ceremonies, she she comes up to me and she's like, Hey, I went outside and there was a portal that opened in the sky, but I'm really scared to go outside. And I'm like, do you want me to go stand outside with you so we can address this? And we go outside and she has this realization that she's not of this earth. And she is actually from, uh, she's, I, I, I don't really love using the word alien. I, I love using the word celestial beings, right? They're, okay, they're from yep. the so she's like, yeah, she was, I feel like, you know, so I feel like I'm from the celestial beings and I'm here on earth. And there's a very specific purpose that I have here on this earth. 
um, that I've been gifted with and that I, that I have a duty for on this, on this earth. And I, I don't quite understand it yet. And it, and then she looks at me and she's like, do I sound crazy? And I'm like, absolutely not, <laughs> not at all. This is, I've had a lot of people that have had this, this, this connection of where they felt that they were from the celestial beings and that they are here on earth. Um, and that there are parts of them that are very essential for wherever humankind, mankind, earth in its entirety is going through, through these um, 3D, 2D, 5D trans, uh, transcending spaces right now. So um, yeah, the, the visions are so unique to the, to the person and the individual. And um, I've had so many people from different religious backgrounds come into the spaces as well. We have very, um, you know, uh, we have, we have, so many different religions in the space if you can name it i've had them sitting in the space and so then also their connections to their gods and their sources are um they're solidified and and they they get this connection that they're longing for as well um i have this one person uh he's like i love coming to this because it's like i'm literally picking up a telephone and i'm talking directly to god you know, it's like, I know that I'm clear, but I get to like pick up my telephone and I feel like I'm talking directly to him. And it's so like, it's such a beautiful process. Like when I hear him and he, he's like, this is why I love this work. And it doesn't change his, it doesn't change his religion. It doesn't change his understanding of his, um, where he is on his path with God. He says that it actually reinforces it and solidifies it. So the medicine meets you right where you are. Um, it's not trying right. to also reprogram that part. Cause a lot of people are like, am I going to not? believe in god anymore or they go through the right, struggle right. a little bit and i said absolutely not also people are also finding their purpose mm-hmm. you know and more desire mm-hmm. within who they are within this life as they realize like we said earlier that you know we're, we're greater than this physical body and they have a connection to whether it's past lives or other existences civilizations what wherever the plant medicine takes you that they it feels is necessary for you to identify with or to recognize yeah Right. Yeah. And also like some of my favorite, unfortunately, I haven't had like any past life regressions. I've had people who've had. You've never life. had a past life I know, regression? I haven't had one, but I've had people why? Who, who've had, they've had insights about my past lives. And they're like, there's a reason why your spirit guides are kind of blocking that for you right now. And I'm like, okay. okay, okay. <laughs> what if you were a pirate? Like you're a pirate on the yeah. seven seas or something like, hunt the day, you yeah. know, but I did have stealing this, all the rum from other ships. You I, know? I did have this woman one time who's always been terrified of the water water and like Ooh. swimming and being in the water and being in open groups of water. And she had Did this, you see the movie Jaws. She had this, yeah. <laughs> she had Terrified this past me, life vision that she drowned. Oh, there you go. And so she, so things started to make sense for her. So like also having these past life insights and making sense of why you do certain things or why you're drawn to certain things in this life. Uh, there's a lot of connections that happen in that as well. Like why, you know, that essence flows through us, you know, it doesn't, it's the avatar that we're holding in us. Right. And that essence flows through us, through our avatars as we move, you know, so that past life remembrance starts to come up a little bit more, why we do certain things or why we're a little avoidant of certain things or why we're drawn to certain people. I love that you use the word avatar. I completely forgot that word. <laughs> it's a good word, huh? And that makes such great sense because our soul and spirit, and I got to write this down so I don't forget this, but that just completely, it's interesting because we're creating stuff within our own technology on the internet and everything that represents consciousness mm-hmm. and, and the physical vessel and bodies where we create these avatars on our phones or on the computers, which is a replication of this body as an avatar of our soul energy. Mm-hmm which comes from the source. So it's just extraordinary that you use that word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love, and so we're so, I had this, one of my personal visions about understanding my avatar or just how special my avatar is, is, um, you know, a lot of people go to like theme parks, like magic yes. or Disneyland. And I have yes. this vision and you know, like when you go to a theme park, you always see people that stand in line for, for three to five hours to get on the ride right and they're sweating in the sun and they're miserable and the kids are everywhere and there's just like it's a it's chaos and you're like why would you like put yourself through this misery to get on 30 seconds of like whatever this you know two minutes or five minutes of this crazy ride for this thrill and my vision is 
this line of these um, energies, our souls are, you know, um, like, oh my God, I can't wait. And below us, we're looking down at the human experience. And I was like, I can't wait to have my heart broken. I wonder what it feels like to (laughs) fall in love. Oh, it's going to be so beautiful. All these experiences, I can't wait to have the human experience. And we're waiting 300,000 eons of millennia through the black holes to get this one chance, this opportunity to be, a, to get our avatar and to have these experiences and to feel everything. And when we get here and our heart gets broken, we get mad. We're like, I don't want to be so sad, but we forget that we wanted this so deeply that we, we couldn't wait. We waited all this time in this line just for this chance to get this avatar, to have these human experiences. So I love That's like, one so of my well put. <laughs> That is so well put. Did you ever see the movie Soul? By sure, Pixar, I did. I think, yes, yes. <laughs> so similar to what you're saying. Yeah, it's, it's extraordinary. So <laughs> and then the one's like, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have to. <laughs> That's like me. I said, I'm done after this one. I'm done, guys. Okay. Yeah. Like, Are you sure? Are you sure? <laughs> yes. Okay. We'll see when we show you much more that you get to experience. Yeah, whoever created you that know? movie, they definitely have done a couple gallons of ayahuasca themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so let's talk about ayahuasca mm-hmm. and it's i always have a hard time spelling it which is crazy Such a it's just it, you're not the only person there's a gazillion people that that spell it probably just the way you do so it's just it's the right way actually <laughs> now does it have like and from your experiences does it have long-term effects i mean what when people talk about long-term effects like uh over time, does it result in any flashbacks, psychosis, anything like that for people? Um, yeah. So there are, you know, of course there's, there's, it, this isn't for everybody. Right. And so I always like to do, I do a screening right. before, um, of people who are on SSRIs, they have to be off of them, you know? So, okay. and, and even sometimes I've had people like on a lot of medications that they have to come off of to be able to participate in the plant medicine work, you know, and getting Getting to that part of the process is hard, especially if you've been on antidepressants right. for 10, 15, 20 years, and this is where your life is to taper off and come off of those is overwhelming. Um, and I don't want to say, I think for my spaces also, I am aware of my capabilities as a practitioner um, and a facilitator, and I know what I can hold and what I cannot hold. So I'm not saying that like some uh, people who have extreme cases of, you know, uh, borderline personality or who really struggle very heavily with um, bipolar um, that, they, that, that, that this space and this medicine can't help them. Um, but they do need to find a practitioner who's well-versed in working with these types of energies within a person, you know, or schizophrenia and stuff like that. Um, from my experience of working with the medicines, um, I haven't had people that have gone into any psychosis or anything like that, but this is again, making sure that there's a healthy integration process afterwards, right? You're going home to a safe space. You're not going back to where the trauma is happening essentially, you know, cause you, you, that this is, very naturally can create um, problems. Um, people who work with therapists surprisingly have a lot of therapists who actually sit in my sessions, like licensed therapists. It's incredible. Um, and uh, telling people to get back into your therapy sessions, like carry on where you're at because you're going to keep, you're just going to keep on. You want to have the support and these tools around you. So again, um, I'm not saying that there isn't uh, that this medicine isn't for everybody, um, but they do need to find a proper practitioner that, has the skills to manage and navigate and also support them after the session to make sure that they um, receive the the proper care that they need in between. What else would you like to tell my listeners about plant medicine and some of your retreats that we haven't touched on? Um, intention, 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 coming right. with a strong intention, what you're coming for. Um, and if if the, you are called to the medicine, trust that it will find you um, and the space will find you like it, it's there. It will come around um, and you have a strong intention, then the healing will come. You know, you have to have it. It can't be for a good time. You know, I also teach people about the dialogue we use. This isn't this isn't a psychedelic drug trip like when you're in college, you know, right. your LSD or your acid. This is this is a very sacred um, space and ceremony that we hold and coming in with that mentality. I think is, is really important. Um, and, and it will really carry you through, through the journey, um, respect for the plants because, and they will come and get you. (laughs) So I like that sacred space. 
you know, I, I do want to do this again next year, mm-hmm. uh, 2023. I'm, I'm leaving for Ireland uh, next month, and then uh, I'll be back in December. And then I want to plan some trips for for uh, to 2023. And this is something I wanted to do because I know when I was at your event, I said, oh, my God, why haven't I been doing these types of retreats, these types of ceremonies a long time ago? Yeah. Because I feel so at home but also I feel like this is a way for me to be more in touch with my spiritual side, my higher consciousness, as well as to recognize more of my purpose. Um, so we can talk later, but I know that some of my listeners and certain individuals I know have showed an interest in this. Maybe, you know, at one of your events, I can let some of my listeners know and they could sign up if they want to go or we could put together a retreat or something i don't know Mm -hmm. but it's something that i know there's a need for it and a lot of people out there would love to probably go to this Mm -hmm. so we can talk later and when i find out some of the schedules you have for 2023 Mm -hmm. and i can reach out to some of my followers to see because uh, I have a, a database and, and and see if anyone wants to go, mm-hmm. but because uh, it's very healing and, yeah. and it's plus it, you know you get away for a weekend. <laughs> such, a, it's such a beautiful yeah, it's such a beautiful therapeutic event, and there's so much we we I mean we don't I tried my best to like also teach you know it's like we teach about the plants, we talk about the hape, you learn so much different music. There's I mean you probably listen to like you, huge 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 you know our minds are being opened on so many levels we're meeting different types of people we're getting uncomfortable we're getting comfortable we're trusting so it is it is uh it is um a really therapeutic a weekend you know and you come back and you're ready you know you have a you, ultimately it's the paradigm shift you know it's like all right i'm ready i'm ready to like clean my house i'm ready to be the best employee at work i'm ready to love my wife like i've never loved her before show up for my kids you know and this is this is what we want and this is what this is what's healing you know just showing up in our everyday life the best we can it was beautiful to see some of the relationships where husbands or wives had dropped off their husband or wife and then they came to pick them up the next day and you just saw this excitement in their eyes and just this, you know, I love you so much. And even one of the people there, his girlfriend showed up and he's telling her how much he loves her. And I'm bawling going, oh my God, I want a relationship like that. You know, it's like, you just see, you know, love, you know, and it was, yeah. it was like, oh my so, God, there's nobody's being judged. Everybody is there to be human, but also to be a higher level of humanity, you know? So, Mm -hmm. yeah, and we're all in this together, you know, like when we all see we're not alone in our pain and our suffering and it it is very, um, you know, to know that we're not alone is very healing in that, in that idea alone, you know, Um, and love is the strongest medicine. Absolutely. (laughs) So, so Linnell, thank you so much for doing this. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. How can people get a hold of you? Is there a way that people can get a hold of you? In uh, yeah, I have an email. Um, hello at plantasmaestras.us. I can send it over to you as well. Send it to me and then I'll post yeah, it. Yeah, and then they can. And then anybody has questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sounds good. Anything else you want to share with no, us? No, thank you so much. Um, go find some plants. Go grow some plants. Grow a tree. Hang out. With- oh, I have. <laughs> I've got. I've got all these flowers I planted in the spring. Yeah. I've got a bird sanctuary in the backyard yes. where I'm letting the corn grow and everything else. Yeah. And it's like the grass. I walk in the grass with my feet to ground, and it's just like it's my nirvana. Yeah. So you know? that grounding process is so beautiful. I have another friend. He loves. That's all he talks about is grounding and how important it is to get in the grass barefoot and roll around. So, (laughs) so beautiful. Thank you again, Chris. And I look forward to talking to you and connecting with you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. This is Chris Fleming and Linnell Furbush. And you've been listening to this month's edition of Spirit Talk. Yay. I hope you, my listener, enjoyed this interview with Linnell and it opened your mind to the benefits of, of plant medicine. But I've got a bonus for you if you want to continue to listen to this journey that I went through. Uh, We had this event that we we got there Friday night. And the first night we did some plant medicine on Friday and then we did it on Saturday. The following morning, such as Saturday morning, I recorded my thoughts and my experience into my digital recorder for about a half hour or so. I did the same thing on Sunday so that I can maintain that feeling, that emotion, that memory of what occurred the night before. Well, I've dropped those audio recordings onto the end of this podcast. So right after I'm done talking here, 
you have the additional bonus to listen to what I went through directly in the location. And I will share with you those details like I just mentioned. Um, each clip's about maybe 30 minutes long or so, which is why this podcast is so long. But I believe it may resonate with a lot of you, as well as get a greater understanding of what just one person can go through. Everybody's different. Please keep that in mind. This was just my journey, my experience. And I'm very grateful that you, the listener, are here to listen to what I got out of it and what I experienced. Enjoy. February 5th. It's about 1.30 in the afternoon. And last night I did my first ayahuasca ceremony. I am in a... uh, probably the mountain time time code in a place in the United States where I'm looking at some beautiful mountains snow capped mountains on one side and there's no snow on the other side <laughs> but there is snow around me uh, there's a chill in the air and I'm sitting on the front porch of one of the cabins there's probably about 20 or so of us here for this event and it's remarkable Everybody has a different journey, a different adventure in doing the plant medicine. I'm just documenting my experience last night. There was about, uh, like I said, 20 of us that all gathered together, sitting down on these soft yoga mats as well as cushions that were on top of it. We had pillows and these type of sit-down chairs that we had. And in doing so... The, our teachers that were there would guide us on what we would be doing. We were given a bucket. We were also given a roll of toilet paper. And we also had uh, a jug of water that we had brought to stay hydrated. There was multiple parts of the ceremony. And from what I remember, um, the first part was, if you wanted to participate, was... I think it's called Hoppy, H-O-P-E. And it's a powder that they had, this gray, granule, uh, sand-like powder that's blended down. And what they would do is they would have like a bamboo-type pipe that would be blown into your nostril, uh, the left nostril, then the right nostril. Of course, I wasn't knowing what to expect. Most of the people participated in this part, and this was to relax the mind and loosen you up before you did ayahuasca. This, unfortunately, was a terrible experience for me, um, and I'll explain why. Is It was first blown into the left nostril, which really burned. Um, it, it, it hurt, I gotta admit. And then I was uh, fearful as he did the right nostril, which wasn't bad at all. Within about 30 seconds, I began to feel really dizzy. Um, I felt myself sinking. I said, oh my God. But right away, I also felt uh, a little sense of vertigo, which I didn't expect. So I laid down in my little section, and we were all side by side around the room. Men were on one side, women were on the other. And as I started to feel it, I felt myself start to get heavier and heavier deeper into the uh, the yoga mat, soft yoga mat I was in, and I had the blanket. I was wearing all white, white sweats, white socks. I had a white t-shirt on, and I had a white hoodie over it. As I began to fall deeper into this state, I did not like the feeling. And it was different from other things that I've felt before. It reminded me of vertigo but without the spinning, but yet the nausea. It reminded me of those few times in my life where I was drunk, going out with friends, or on my birthday, and I was back in my room, whether it was in college or at home, with one foot on the floor and the other foot on the bed, is trying to offset the spinning. It's that spinning sensation where you feel nauseated and then you vomit. That was the feeling that I was feeling without the spinning, that nausea. It also flashed me back to once when I was in the hospital doing a test, VNG test, I guess, where they test your eyes and and how dizzy you get from the eyes to the brain as well as the ears. 
And I remember the doctor had held my head to the left and then to the right, and I told him I didn't like that. It bothered my brainstem, and I went into a pseudo-seizure and got rushed to the hospital. That nauseous feeling. And it was just interesting how all those different memories that related to it, like going to one of those what do you call it? Those three-dimensional reality rides that you get in and you got this big picture screen and the ride's going up and down and left and right. I, my brain has always been very sensitive to motion, even in car sickness. It felt like all that. Uh, every single type of nausea related to those different events was all happening simultaneously. But here's where it gets interesting. As I was doing that, I said, oh my God, just surrender to it, relax, you know, don't get fearful. I saw my father appear And my father was walking up to me very quickly like a spirit and putting his hand on my chest to push me down and say, son, just, just give in, just allow this to happen. Relax, relax. And then I saw these angels, uh, spirit guides and angels that were there as well. And then for a brief moment, I saw other people higher up by the ceiling that I don't recognize all lined up like some type of council. And then for a brief moment, I felt some of my relatives and then my cats that I had, you know, that had passed away many years ago. So I felt, oh my gosh, I'm not alone. But then I had a fear of this loosening and not having control of the nausea and how I felt of negative entities coming towards me and attacking me. And then I saw this circle of angels all around us top and bottom as if there was two levels and I saw quickly these dark masses and and grotesque type entities, creatures, whatever you want to call it, quickly racing towards all of us but then being bounced off, pushed off and when I saw this I closed my eyes and said white protection around me and let this bubble expand even further around myself and everybody else and that is what happened. And as this occurred, I noticed that the angels were there facing inwards towards us with their backs outwards. And as that occurred, there was this sign of protection around all of us, which was extraordinary. That put me at ease as if they were allowing me to see that it's okay, you're protected. This is a safe place. And my father says to me, see, son, everything's okay. You're going to be fine. Don't worry about that. And I'm like, but I don't like this. I don't like this feeling. I don't like this nausea. I don't want this. I don't, you know, I made a mistake. Why did I do this? Because it was not good, the nausea. So I laid there and I noticed that whenever I moved, even my hand or a finger, um, the nausea increased, you know, very similar to motion sickness. I tried to sit up and I went into a like hunched over position, made my back uncomfortable, but I felt like it was eliminating the nausea. If I laid down more, I was getting more nauseated and my neck was bothering me between the C1 and the C3. I got to a point where I started quickly getting these cold and hot sweats and I can feel my body trying to perspire and get out all the toxins in my body as well as this this medicine, this plant medicine. And then the instructor and teacher, which I really don't remember much of this, is talking to everybody else. I think they noticed that I was having a hard time with this. And then I started to vomit. <laughs> I could not contain the, the painful feeling of nausea in my stomach. And I started vomiting, vomiting, vomiting. Um, And I was worried that this was going to cause a domino effect with everybody else in the room doing the same thing, which did not occur. I sat there partially embarrassed, but partially like, oh my God, this is not what I expected, not what I wanted. What do I mean by not what I wanted? Well, when you do an ayahuasca ceremony, you set an intention to the universe of what you want to accomplish, what you want to face, what you want to heal. And I had a couple things. One of my primary, my search for this was to find healing for my neck, for my head, for my concussion, my TBI back in 2009, but also with hopes that the brain would heal and it would eliminate the pain in my neck and begin to heal the pain in the neck. That was primarily uh, why I'm doing this. 
because I've heard many people that have had brain injuries or concussions have healed from doing ayahuasca. Well, at this point, I realized I wasn't doing ayahuasca yet. I was doing this hobby, and I didn't like it. The second intent was I wanted to come in contact with my father and the angels. Well, obviously, they showed up right away, and they were there. So it seems like I accomplished that. I didn't want to be under that frame of mind physically, uh, being sick and being disoriented because of the sickness to meet them. But I guess we can't pick and choose how it's going to happen. But for them to show up or allow me to see them right away, even in this uncomfortable experience that I was dealing with, I guess accomplished that other intent. The third intent was to heal any past emotion from relationships, which I got to experience briefly with the ayahuasca, which I'll get to. The fourth, which I felt too, was because of my lifetime of supernatural and spiritual experiences, including some divine intervention in my out-of-body astral as well as near-death experiences. I was hoping to have another profound experience, whether it was in front of the Creator, my spirit guides, counsel, or even the angels telling me what I needed to know within this life that I need to work on or what I need to do. Those were the other forms of intent that I had not reached yet. Well, I'm in this state of nausea because I was not feeling well. Um, other people got up then briefly after whatever time went by with this. I just don't know. They got up to then start the ayahuasca which was the second stage, I personally at that point did not want to do the ayahuasca. And I said, I'm not doing anything. There's, I cannot continue. Recognizing how I was feeling, these, these teachers that are there for this were extraordinary, very loving, very caring, very empathetic and compassionate. And um, several of them got up and assisted me, says, we need to move you into a chair. And... Uh, when one of them, Bo, got in front of me and Jordan was behind me, these big bodybuilder type guys that, that are like angels on earth, as well as Roger and, and Linnell and some other individuals, they all took my hand and guided me one in front that I put my hands on and one behind me to make sure I didn't fall because I was very woozy and dizzy. They guided me to a chair away from everybody else uh, to sit in a lounge chair. And it was at that moment I realized I'm in good hands that not only did I see all these angels that were there, but these individuals were very caring. They understood what I was going through and that it was okay for me to trust them. And it was at that moment I started to tear up, got emotional because we can't always find people or be in situations where we can trust. And unfortunately there's many things in life where people disappoint us. But at this point, people that I just met uh, cared enough about what I was going through and understood it, that they were there for me in that moment when I needed them. And that, to me, was such an amazing experience right there. I was guided to the chair, and I sat down, and I still didn't feel well. Um, I don't remember what happened right after that. They were just asking me questions, how I felt, and this and that, and did I want to do the ayahuasca at that point? I said no. Um, but then later they asked me, I said, okay, well, maybe I'll try it. And because I knew that's why I was here to do that, and I really wanted to heal. Uh, Linnell was nice enough to bring me, uh, I guess it was water with fruit in it or, or coconut water, I don't know what it was, but I drank that real quickly. I engulfed that down and swallowed it, and that was to hydrate me. And then afterwards, I took the first shot, just a small dose of ayahuasca, and I just laid there. It tasted horrible, uh, bitter, like, I don't even know what to compare it to, but it was horrible. It was so bitter and just, ugh. But they gave me some grapes to digest right after to help bring it down and take away some of the bitterness. I didn't really feel anything from it. I felt a warmth in my stomach. And then uh, not too long afterwards, they gave me a second dose. And I took the second dose. And after the second dose, I still didn't feel anything. Um, I go, God, I don't feel anything. What's going on? But I knew it just tasted so bad. I think about an hour or two hours had gone by, and I'm sitting in the chair trying to be comfortable. The nausea slightly subsiding uh, that I had felt from the Hopi. Um, I started looking around the room. I saw people that were in their journeys. They're in their experiences, and they were they were journeying with this ayahuasca. And I looked around. I go, why am I not experiencing this? And then I remember they gave me a third dose. 
I'm like, my God, how many doses are we going to do? It's not working for me. But here's what's interesting. I was expecting a dramatic supernatural experience as if I was going to leave my body or my consciousness was going to expand into other dimensions and realms, whether I was going to see some type of kaleidoscope colors that I've seen once before taking an edible, too much edible of a cannabis, or that I was going to be whisked off to another place or a door was going to open up and I was going to see all these angelic beings. None of that was happening. And I was, I was upset. Music was playing in the background. They would play certain songs, and then some people brought instruments, and they'd be playing the instruments. And a song came on, and I don't remember the exact lyrics, but someone says, you call upon me, and I'll be there with you. And then all of a sudden, I started thinking of my dad. I said, oh my God, my dad was here in the beginning. You know, that was part of my intent, and he guided me through. And I started crying. I started crying, and I'm like, Dad, I love you so much. You know, I miss you. I love you so much. And then you know, I kind of felt him a little bit, and I was tearing up from that as if I was purging out those emotions. Then I started feeling this trickling feeling in the back of my head and my neck. I was like, oh my God, what's this? It's, it's affecting me right in the back of the area that my head was damaged in the C1, C2, and C3. And I felt this trickling, like melting sensation. And I said, oh my God, the ayahuasca is moving into that part of my brain. It's trying to make its way in there to to, to heal or to, I, I don't know what it was doing, whether it was back in the pineal gland or it was somewhere, but I felt it moving in that area that I tend to always get inflammation and pain, discomfort and neurological issues. I said, oh my God, it's working. So I start focusing on surrender, surrender. Okay, ayahuasca, do your job, heal, heal. And I'm focusing on that, even though I don't feel well. And then eventually that subsided. And then I was thinking about some past relationships and one of them in particular, the most recent one from last year, where I was really hurt uh, from her uh, because of her behaviors and uh, lies and well as manipulations and deceit. And as I started to see her and her daughter it switched to where I was seeing just the interactions with her daughter, where her daughter says, I love you, Chris, and when I would come over, hi, Chris, and she'd give me hugs, or when she was on the the, the uh, iPhone video, and she would get on there and talk to me, and we'd talk and play games or whatever, and then, like, the last few times I saw her, and she says, we're a family now, and she would hug us, and how bad I wanted that, and the universe was showing me that because they wanted me to realize that that was... My experience in this relationship was to have that experience with her and to understand that. So, to continue, is that I was seeing those, those brief moments with her daughter to where they were showing me that that was the experience that I was meant to get out of that relationship, was to see that I could care for, love, and become family with a child that is not my child because I've always grew up thinking like you know I don't want to be with somebody that already has kids I want to have my own kids you know I want it to be my child but there was the first time in my life in any relationship to where I completely accepted this child and felt like that child was my own and it was interesting because we had bonded and there was a soul type connection which I guess we had experienced another life before and yet here she was in my life at this time and we were sharing that, that time that brief moment together and I felt that was extraordinary so I believe there was a healing that was taking place there by the universe showing this is why you had that experience even though it was painful we wanted you to see for that period of time that you can love someone else's child you can accept them and in doing that, you express yourself as a human being, as a father, as whatever that may be. That's another way for you to love and care for people, is to also accept their child and to bond with that child. I think that was the most painful thing about the relationship when it ended, was not continuing that and growing that to become a complete family. And then eventually have kids as well together and growing that family. I think that, and I, I think I know that was the most painful thing. But yet in this brief moment of memory and reflection that I was sitting there relaxed, I do believe the ayahuasca was showing me that. 
And within those few minutes that I was seeing that and feeling that, it was saying, Chris, this was your lesson from that. So another part of my intent, the second intent, I believe had been confronted, which is remarkable. So here I am still hoping to have some spiritual experiences, to see some other stuff out of body, even more dramatic and profound and divine. And it wasn't occurring. But as I would close my eyes, I would see these flashes coming from the right. And I would open them up and go, what is that, just the flickering of the candles? I'm like, no, the candles aren't flickering. There's no light or, or wind blowing in here. So I close my eyes again, and I would see this big spark of light, like a, like a flash. And I couldn't understand that. Later, I was able to understand as one of the individuals that was having her experience, who was basically 10 feet in front of me, laying on the floor, said she kept seeing and having these flashes of lightning around her that was occurring with her spirit and her soul and part of her journey. So it's interesting as I believe I was seeing just a little bit of that, that flash and light that was also affecting electromagnetic field in my space. So that became very interesting to me. Um, I didn't understand at the time, but in us downloading and sharing our stories, I believe that's what it was. So here I am sitting here going, okay, well, where's where's my dad again? You know, why isn't he appearing to me? I don't want to see his complete form. Why aren't the angels flying around me? Why don't I see them? Why am I standing in the great hall or, you know, in front of my council of, of guides? And I was hoping that to happen. But then I also, they said, okay, you're going to get your third ayahuasca. And then the fourth, I go, a fourth? Oh, my God, I don't want to do a fourth. You know, I don't want to get sick. I don't want to. I had this fear of this loosening causing me to get more nauseated. So I get up on my own and I walk over to do the fourth one. And it's a bigger portion. So I take the fourth one. Once again, I didn't feel anything. And no shift no movement, no out-of-body, no higher consciousness connection, no paradigm of kaleidoscope colors or mathematical equations or universe or, or elementals, nothing. And I started getting disappointed. I'm like, what the heck? Why? Why am I not having these bigger experiences? Why am I not seeing this? And it was as if a voice said to me, Chris, you've already had these experiences. You've already gone there. And then I said to it, I said, but what about my life purpose? You know, I want to know more about what I'm supposed to do. And it's like, you already know what you're supposed to do. You're already doing it. And I sat there going, oh my God, you're right. And I looked around the room and I said, have these people had these types of experiences in their life that I've had? And probably not. And here I am saying, I want to have an even bigger experience. I want to have an even more dramatic experience. And yet I wasn't having it. Because I believe my guides in the universe were telling me, no, it's not necessary. These other things we've already presented to you and showed you that you, you have these things around you. Your father is always with you and that your past experience was this. And now you ask for some other messages or divine intervention of what your path is. But you already know what your path is. How many times do we need to tell you? But then there was a part of this when I'm laying there going, oh, my God, I wasted my time to come here. Spent the money and everything. What am I doing here? What a waste. And I'm like, I don't want to do any, anything else. I want to do any more of these. And that's why I felt for a few moments. And it's like, you know, nothing happened. I didn't feel anything. Not, I didn't experience anything when I was sharing it with a couple of their friends that were there. So then we were done, and uh, some soup was made for us, some ginger soup, um, some ginger and garlic soup. And at first I was not able to tolerate anything. I said, no, I don't want any food because I still feel really nauseated. And at this point, my stomach was hurting really bad as if I got punched in the stomach. And I believe that was because, not only because I was nauseated and sick, but I believe the ayahuasca and everything, the bitterness of the stomach was causing me that to be upset. But eventually I gave in and said, I need to put something in my body. So I had the soup and uh, then I had another bowl with the potatoes and the vegetables and it was delicious. And I'm so glad I did. It was at this point, which I think was about four in the morning, we were told to uh, go back to our, our rooms and get some rest, and we'd be woken up and, and brought in at seven in the morning to discuss some other stuff. So what I did was I got up, went back to the room, I put on some eye goggles and some earplugs, and then I laid down, and uh, I brought my vomit bucket and everything just in case, and I slept. And I slept pretty good. 
And then uh, when I woke up seven in the morning when we were awoken and we were brought in to, uh, we were told to come, you know, back to the ceremony, we'd, we'd get together and we would do a download and then we would have some breakfast. I said, okay, and the cool air felt good. And I said, you know what? I feel really good. Still slightly nauseated, but I feel great, much better than I did. You know what? I, I need to do this again tonight. Now, I'm not going to do the hoppy. I'll do the ayahuasca. So I need to give it another go tonight. So we all got together in the room, and we all told our stories about last night and some amazing, strong individuals. The one thing about this is that we learn to trust one another and become vulnerable and sharing our stories and opening up about our past, our pain, our trauma, our injuries, what we want out of our life, what we're hoping to get out of it. There's a lot of emotions. And that's a wonderful thing to see is all these souls that have gone through so much, share their stories, open up, and they all want healing, as we all do. And I felt, God, I am meant to be here. This is remarkable. We're all equal. And it was interesting also to see some of these individuals that are some of the teachers there that guided us and helped us, the shamans, we'll call them, and them open up as well about their journey that led them here to do what they do, to contribute and to help people. And I sat there thinking about the bridge. And if you know my story about the bridge, I sat there thinking like, oh my God, there I was on the bridge seeing all these people and realized it's not about me, it's about me contributing and helping these people and I need to come back and I came back. These people have had the same experience. They've gone through stuff in their life, and they're here now to help people as well as we all are. And I felt so at home. I said, oh my God, I'm around my people. I'm around people that get it, that understand, which not everybody on this planet does. But yet here's all these people that have gone through a lot like I have. Maybe more, maybe less. Regardless, they're here to contribute and to help other people as well. I said, wow. This is beautiful. So I shared my story the best I could, and I listened, listened intently to every single person's journey and story because many of them resonated with me, and I would tear up. I cried more for other people's stories than I did for telling my own because I could feel the pain they went through, the hope the regrets or whatever, the journey they wanted to go on and what they have done and the success that they have had in previous ayahuasca ceremonies. And I said, wow, look at all these amazing people that I can learn from as well. So I found it very interesting. This is Saturday. I'm going to go shower now. I'm going to go sleep for a couple hours. And then tonight we start again um, to go on another journey so that we can partake in another ceremony of ayahuasca. I'm not going to do the Hopi. I am going to do the ayahuasca, and I'm hoping from there I will continue to fulfill some of my other intents, and who knows, maybe I will have another journey. I will catalog this and document this on recording tomorrow after my journey. This was part one. Coming up next is part two. Today is Sunday, February 6th, and I want to share with what I experienced last night, Saturday night, when I was in my space doing ayahuasca. I didn't know what to expect this time around, being the second night, as I didn't have an ayahuasca experience as much as I would have liked to the first night. During the day, obviously, I reflected on what I did experience Friday night, um, how I got sick from the hoppy, but I still had some encounters, some little bit of revelations, and some flashbacks to certain memories to better understand. The ceremony last night I skipped the hobby part of me wanted to do it it seems in talking with some of the teachers there that I may have had too much and then also I had swallowed some of it and not blown it out of my nose right away which does tend to cause you to get sick 
and one individual had expressed that it's no different than if you had chewing tobacco and you've swallowed it, it makes you really sick. So that seems to be what happened. So I decided to skip that part of the ceremony. But when we began the ayahuasca ceremony, I had taken a cup of it, I went and laid down, and I didn't feel anything. <laughs> After about an hour, I'm like watching everybody. Some people are going into their transition. The medicine is taking over. The plant medicine is affecting them. For me, it wasn't. And I was like, oh no, here we go again. So then I went and had the second cup. And with the second cup, I went and laid down. I said, okay, now I got a good feeling about this. And with the second cup, I began to feel myself start to sink slightly. And I began to feel the plant medicine start to move into my body. Now, there's certain things I have forgotten because there was so much that did go on. But I do want to share what I can remember. What had hit me from the first night was seeing all the angels around protecting us, then seeing a higher row of spirit guides lined up and then people behind them. I had a glimpse of my cats that had passed away. I've had like five cats passed away since I was born. And for a brief moment, I saw them and felt them, their love, their presence, so to speak, not from the past, not memories from the past, but I'm talking about present memories. Even though it was very short, I felt it. Now, what was interesting about this, the second night, is after the second cup, I slightly began to feel them again, and then it quickly shifted to the cats that I have now. Noir, my black coon cat that is now about 15 years old. Sweden, who I got in 2011 that's now 11 years old, white Persian. And Noel, a black and gray tabby, who's about nine years old. Each one of them are very loving cats. They all get along, and they mean a lot to me, and they remind me of my previous cats. Each one of them has a quality that reminds me of my previous cats, but mostly Noel, who I believe could possibly be a reincarnation of Squirt, because I've been told that pets can come back and we can love them through another what was interesting about these scenes I began to see and feel within my mind was the attention, the passion, the, you know, the respect I have for animals. But I was seeing me petting each one of these cats individually. And what I tend to do sometimes is I will hold their head, pet, you know, pet the back of their ears. I will get up close to them with my face and we will lock eyes and I will look into their eyes and not only tell them I love them <clears throat> but I also will project it and trying to look into their eyes into their soul saying how much I love you thank you for being within my life thank you for being here for sharing this space this life with me but then also as I look into my cat's eyes I also tell the Creator how much I love the Creator and thank the Creator for creating these beings, these animals, these pets, and using a sequence of you know, destiny for them to end up within my life to share this life with me, that, that gratitude. And I was seeing each one of them that I was doing that with, how I've taken that time, and I continue to always do that, almost like weekly. And it's just the universe was showing me how important that is in my life, but then I realized that a lot of the hard things I've gone through in the last 10 years since my accident, work, relationships, financial issues, you name it, ups and downs with friendships, 
that this unconditional love from these three pets was established by the universe. It was important for them to be in my life during these periods of time to show me not only love, companionship, but also, most importantly, support. That I had a responsibility to be here to take care of them. That even though other things have disappeared within my life and I've had these ups and downs and hard times, they were still there by my side to remind me that I exist and that I need to be here. And for this moment that I was seeing this and expressing this, it was as the universe was telling me that they played part in this. It's something I, I kind of already knew, but I experienced it at a higher level of understanding and an appreciation that there was a divine instrument, a synchro destiny in place that all three of these cats ended up in my life for a reason. And it would take three of them to manifest that path and that destiny which I'm on. Now, as I shifted away from this, I began to see some of my past relationships and stuff, the things that didn't work out and some of the things that they did to me and that was quickly pushed away like, no, you don't need to think about those anymore. That's the past. That had more to do with them than it had to do with you, but unfortunately you suffered because you wanted so much more out of those relationships and you didn't get the respect, the love that you deserved. But you must remind yourself that it is not you, it is them. And then I began to see my future as if there will be better relationship or relationships. It is up to me in my choices and my decisions. And for me, that was very heartwarming that there is something to look forward to. There is, there is a rainbow coming, so to speak, of better days. Then I said, okay, well, let's get away from stuff that I've already thought about, but yet you're showing me at a higher level. Let's go deeper into the consciousness. And then, this is kind of funny, I sat up and uh, I looked around the room and then I looked, there was this little mantle that was in front of us in, in the middle of the whole group, had a vase of flowers it had all these little tea light candles around it. But there was space between the tea light candles and this vase of flowers. And they had the music playing really loud, a lot of spiritual music and singing. And a lot of these songs had specific meaning. And then I began to see, not with my eyes, it was more of my mind, whether I was just imagining it, which is what I probably think it was, is these white little figures were dancing around in circles, very pagan-like, <laughs> going around this vase. And I looked closer, and it looked like they were little white, yellow fairies, like elementals. And I was watching this. I go, okay, I'm not seeing this in my eyes, but I'm seeing it in my head. And I'll turn away, and I'll look back, and there they are. It's like, this is like, am I just imagining this because of the ayahuasca, or am I tapping into something that's really there? I don't, honestly, I don't know. I think maybe it was just some type of imagination process of what I was experiencing telling me to Chris, you know, don't fight the music, allow the music to take over. Because about 20 minutes before, I told one of the teachers, can we turn the music down? It's really bothering me. It's so loud. Or is that part of the process? He goes, that is part of the process. I'm like, oh. So I kept fighting the music. And I think by seeing this, this little visual, this, this hallucination or whatever it was of these fairies dancing around, they're going up and down, kind of like Indians do, like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're going around this face were telling me, just allow the music to take over, become one with the music. And here's what's interesting. As soon as I did that, I laid down and then my mind shifted. And I zoomed in on the old, old typewriters that had the keys. When you would press the key, there would be the little metal image, like lithograph type thing of the letters and numbers. And be that charcoal gray metal color. And I zoom in on that, and all of a sudden, then there's all of these letters and numbers. 
And then it becomes like machinery. It becomes like three or fourth dimensional to where there's these grinding rotors of these numbers and they're just rotating and moving with this long depth of field, like rows and rows of them, some bigger and some smaller, that now I'm within this dimension of this industrial numbers and words. And, and as that began to rotate, individually rotating different ways, kind of like a clock system upon clock upon clock upon clock, these motors of numbers, they slowly started shifting into other patterns. Some became geometric patterns of colors, kind of like kaleidoscope type things. But they were flowing and transitioning and dissolving into other things as if I was going deeper and deeper into some type of creative process. Now this is what I would compare it to like some psychedelic experience. You've seen certain videos from the 70s or whatever it was, the Beatles or even the Pink Floyd, The Wall, where they show a flower come out and it turns into a leg and something else and then battleships and everything. And it just keeps transitioning and morphing is the word I should use, morphing into other things. And that's what was happening there was in my mind, I was seeing this. It was like a dream, but even though I could open up my eyes, I could still see it. So I decided to close my eyes and I put a little mask over my eyes to block out any light or anything else, even though it was dark in the room with just some candles going. And I can hear other people either crying emotionally or, or breathing or moving about as the music played. Everybody was having their own individual experience, some good, some bad, and some still struggling. But I decided to follow this path and journey. I said, okay, take me on this journey. And then it kept metamorphosizing and transitioning into just different patterns. What type of patterns? Well, then all of a sudden you see like almost like a, a penguin type stuffed doll, like an anime type penguin. But they were all side by side like dynamo, uh, like dominoes. And rows and rows stacked on top of each other. And they were moving on an angle, like diagonally, like flowing like a wave or like a roller coaster. And then other in the back and in the foreground, there'd be other waves of the same type of patterns. It's like if you had a whole sheet of stamps, okay? Like you had this long, long roll of stamps and you had all these waves going of it as if the wind was blowing, but yet they were three-dimensional and then fourth-dimensional. And as this was happening, it would metamorphosize into something else. And I would begin to see the dimensions and different angles of it, some like, like Escher drawings and paintings. And I even saw one where the man was going up the stairs dimensionally, the stairs and the stairs would start to curve and turn into something else, a library and then a structure of a castle. And the castle would then start to move the pieces individually in different forms into something else. Then what was interesting, I would see snakes and serpents. And I would see these snakes slithering around and then they would jump out to strike me and they would freeze real slow. They would start to get really slow as they come towards me, freeze, and then they would start to dissolve into something else or metamorphosize into something else. Or something else would come out of their mouths and then something out of their mouths and something out of their mouths and then smaller out of that mouth and then it would crystallize into a metamorphosis of something else. Once again, this is like some type of psychedelic trip of consciousness then there would be numbers and geometric patterns and beautiful colors yellows blues greens reds magentas and other mixtures of v vibrant and bright colors this continued but then what was interesting is then i would see all these black like grasshoppers and other insects like oh my god this is disgusting this is gross this is kind of becoming dark but quickly, whatever was dark would then explode or burst into something more beautiful. Like then I see this type of demonic creature. It lunges at me and then it freezes, stops. And it slowly starts to metamorphosize into all these tiny little butterflies that just, with beautiful colors that fly off, that spread out. And then those butterflies, the colors become larger and larger, the pieces of the colors on the butterflies that then metamorphosize into something else. And as I was seeing this, it was like as if things that were negative or dark or would impose fear on somebody else was turning into 
something beautiful, something artistic. It's as if my love for the creative process, my love for artwork, design, was all taking shape and form as if whatever past memories that were scary, nightmarish, dark, sinister, was all turning into even pain or suffering. Like at one point I saw this dead carcass, whether it was a a white rabbit or something, and all these maggots were coming out of it quickly, very fast. And as the maggots came out, they slowly turned into something else that was like more beautiful. And then grass grew out of it, and then these trees and flowers, and then the flowers turned into these balloons, and the balloons turned into something else, and then the balloons turned into something even more interesting and colorful and beautiful. And it was like, this was like the cycle of life and death, of light and dark, fear and happiness, anger and sadness, and then joy and cheer. But I was seeing it in all shapes and forms, in an artistic, metamorphosis way, as if the universe was showing me, downloading this creative process. Now what's interesting, the latter part of the intent that I wrote out... See if I can read it to you. I had stated within my tent the other parts of my tent I did experience. But I said also reaching deep inside to unlock my full potential, capabilities, and gifts so I may fully express and create in this world and contribute to others through inspiration, entertainment, art love and healing in all the work I do. So I'd stated I wanted to unlock my full capabilities of the expression and creative process because I love art. The full potential. And here was what I believe was this this code, this DNA, intelligent, infinite, infinite, higher conscious intelligent being expressed in visuals, numbers, geometric patterns in a very colorful an artistic way. And as this continued, I remember they then kind of like shrugged me and says, would you like to do a third cup? And I said, yes, I want to go deeper. So they helped me up and I was a little dizzy and could barely, you know, I couldn't stand completely. So they assisted me, took me to the next cup. But there was trust because they were, they wanted us to experience that higher consciousness. And as they guided me to take the note, they said, what is your intent? I said, well, I would like to go deeper and and see my dad and my spirit guides. Okay, then that's your intent. And I drank the cup. I'm like, okay, great. I'm going to go deeper. I'm going to go past these, this realm, this layer of, of intelligence and and higher consciousness. I'm going to go even deeper. Well, I didn't go deeper. (laughs) I didn't get to see my dad this second night. I didn't get to see the council and stuff like that. But I went deeper and more into this creative process where these images started to take shape and form of actual entities, of personalities. And as this metamorphosis kept coming, I was going deeper and deeper into these layers, very similar to kaleidoscopes, but these things had more specific patterns. Like images, like if you had a painting on a wall and then you replicated it to where the entire room was covered with these same images of these paintings. Very similar to Andy Warhol's repetition that he did, which I know very well about because I studied fine art and and I did a paper on Andy Warhol. And I was fascinated by his use of repetition. So here it was, though, in another realm that was multi-layered and dimensional, not two-dimensional in our realm. So I was realizing the other capabilities, which we're probably going to start seeing in art, where art becomes more dimensional rather than just two-dimensional. It's as if it was showing me that that is the future of art. So I began to see more and more of these images, and some I've forgotten. But it was a wonderful, beautiful journey, like you were watching a big IMAX screen. You were a part of uh, a reality. I had goggles on, you were part of this new reality. And you were witnessing everything unfolding, and you were just flying through this. Or it was coming towards you. But then things started to shift slightly. And one of the things was, it's kind of funny, is all of a sudden I'm at this table and, you know, these images are coming at me and they become dark and I'm in this black room and then the black black room becomes light and then I'm at this poker table and there is a 
lamp that's hanging down over the poker table and I can see cards, but what's in front of me, the only person I really see in front of me, I knew there was other people to the left and to the right, and I'm seated at this table for some reason. There is a bear. We're talking about a bear. Not Smokey Bear, but it's like Smokey Bear, but without the hat on. And he's got cards in his hand. And he's looking at his cards. He looks at me. He looks at his cards. And then he folds his cards down on the table and he spreads it out and he's got a full house. And then he points to me and he says, what do you got? <laughs> and I'm like, what do I got? I'm not even playing cards. I look at him and I go, what are you talking about? I don't even know why I'm at this table. I'm not playing cards. I don't have any cards in my hand. Why am I here? And he just looks at me like, well, don't you want to play cards? I'm like, no. <laughs> Here I am talking to it out loud. I'm saying, no, I don't want to play cards. I'm just on this journey. Why did I stop here for this? He gets up, starts to walk away, and then it fades. And I see all these other images that I couldn't make sense of. And then all of a sudden I look up, and there's this giant, like maybe eight feet tall, centipede-type creature leaning over me with all these tentacles making these clicking sounds and everything. Now, most people would probably be Terrified. I mean, this was like some type of alien type creature you'd see on the cover of a comic book from the 50s or 60s, like out in space, right? But I was, there was no fear. I was just in awe and enjoyment of all the things I was seeing. I didn't feel that I was in any danger whatsoever. I was observing even though they were trying to participate with me. And it leans over to try to interact, whether it was trying to create fear or wanting me to respond. I look up and I go, hello. <laughs> I look up at this thing and I'm like, hello. Now, I'm actually doing this physically. I am leaning over and looking up at it. And I'm like saying, hi, what do you want? You know, you don't scare me. And it just kind of looked at me and then it separated into other geometric patterns and shapes and then became something else. It was at this point that things began to slowly dissolve more and it wasn't continuing, like the journey was starting to come to an end. But what was interesting during this time too is I was kind of getting bumped here and there. Someone would walk by and hit my feet or the pillow or the person next to me would kind of roll over and their bucket would hit me and they would move. And, and that was kind of bothering me because I was being pulled out of this space and I wanted to be back in. So I felt it would have been better if we had more space in between us. And that was necessary. And there's a couple of times I sat up to see if anybody was in the back couch because I want to go sit on that couch to get away from everybody else to have some privacy within my journey. That was the only like negative thing that I felt about it that was frustrating me because I wanted to continue down this wonderful journey of creativity of where the universe was taking me, this dimension that I was going into and these multiple layers of creation or, or dimensional possibilities. But, you know, there was distractions here and there. So... It was at this point, though, I started hearing voices and stuff. Spirits would pop up and try to interact. And I said, no, no, I'm, I'm focusing on these other dimensional experiences. And, which, and it kept, I kept getting interrupted. I kept hearing you know, voices and stuff. And I would open up my eyes and look, and there's nothing there. But I realized, okay, this sometimes happens naturally to me. When I'm staying at a hotel or I'm, even I'm at home, you know, maybe once a month, a couple times a month. And when I travel, it happens at certain hotels, whether they're haunted or not, spirits will try to interact. And I'm like, you know, no, I don't want any of that. So it was like at this layer, like spirits were, I was coming down off of this high and I was in between our dimension and the spirit realm. So my consciousness, our consciousness can travel into other layers. We know this with remote viewing and in actually talking to an actual remote viewer, discussing how our consciousness can expand and go into other layers of dimension between time and space. It was obvious that now my consciousness was on a slower, a different frequency and vibration that was more earthbound in our three-dimensional realm, but just slightly into the fourth dimension where a lot of the spirits are. So now the spirits started trying to make contact with me and I even felt one fly over me and try to pass through me. And they were just, some were trying to be playful or just try to have a conversation because they knew that my consciousness was now shifting slightly in their realm. Now, if you read and you've studied the gateway analysis that Army Intelligence did and on the CIA website 
I don't even tell you that you have to protect yourself with the white bubble as you travel out of body with consciousness because there's certain entities that exist in this layer just outside our realm. And I believe that's what I was accessing. And these were trying to communicate with me, but I, I didn't want to because I was not there to communicate with them. I was there for my own personal journey. So then the ceremony was done and we were all you know, allowed to go have some soup, some ginger soup and uh, garlic soup. And uh, I was still feeling the medicine, the plant medicine going through me. So I wanted to just sit there and continue to experience that. And I was tired and a little groggy from it. But it got to a point where I got up and I forced myself to have some soup to get some of the soup in me. I really didn't purge that much except for when they told us, okay, the ceremony is over. Everybody sit up and they did a few prayers before we were released to go have some food. I did because I was dealing with extreme pain in my neck too. This night I was dealing with so much pain in my neck. And as I sat up and I tried to move my head, the pain was overwhelming to where because of the pain I got nauseated. I grabbed the bucket and I, I purged. Not a lot, just a little bit. The ayahuasca wasn't affecting me in that way where I was getting sick from it. While many other people were, were vomiting profusely, purging, we like to call it profusely, from the plant medicine. But for me, it was just a little because I did that the night before with the hobby. So I decided to lay back down for a little bit, then get some soup, and then I grabbed my pillow, my blanket, and the bucket just in case, and I went back to the room. Now, the room I was staying at was like a little little bungalow, a little hut, and there's bunk beds in there. And the other person I was sharing with, Travis, was, was still having some food and stuff, and then some people went outside and they had a fire going. Now, this is like 4.30 in the morning, just so you understand. We have to be back at 7 in the morning to download and share our experiences with the entire group, have a few, a little bit of food, and then pack up and leave. So I said, you know, I'm going back to the room. And there's nobody else in there. I changed my clothes. I jumped into the bed. And I was still feeling the plant medicine, so I laid down. I put some eye goggles on and earplugs in. And here's a crazy thing. I kept hearing and feeling the door open and someone walk in standing next to me, and I thought it was Travis coming in to jump into his bunk bed across from me. And I would keep leaning over and looking up, and he wasn't there. Now, my mind was highly active still in the plant medicine, so I was not able to really fall asleep because it was just going through this process of still experiencing stuff. Going on this journey instead of being still, going into darkness and just going to sleep, going into deep REM. But I kept hearing voices, and I heard Chris, and I'd jump and turn around, there's nobody there, and then I thought I heard a friend's voice, and it wasn't there, and then I thought I heard something else, and it's like I was accessing, you know, obviously the spirit realm at this point. Even I heard the door open, someone walked to the side and stand there, and I felt someone standing behind me, just like I felt at certain hotels I've stayed at, and there's a ghost there, and I turn around, and there's nobody there, and I'm like, gosh darn it, stop this. I go, leave me alone. I said, I don't want to talk to the spirits right now. This was for me. And there's even some times that I thought, heard the bed moving or whatever, or the door slammed shut, and nobody there. So I was like, oh my God, I'm not going to sleep. And I really didn't. I tossed and turned. I couldn't get comfortable. My neck was bothering me, and my mind was wide awake until at 7 a.m. someone knocks on a door, opens up a door, says, okay, get up, everybody, come meet in the hall, and we'll do our download. And I'm like, oh. All right, let's go. So I said, Travis, how'd you sleep? He says, Oh, I slept not bad, a little bit, you know. And, but I didn't go to bed till like five, six. So I only slept like an hour or so. And I said, Man, I haven't slept. And we just kind of laughed, shared a little bit of our experience. Then we went with the group, and we all told our stories, our downloads. So I didn't get the second night to go into a higher realm, such as heaven or the afterlife, and sit with the council and stuff like that. I'm not disappointed. Because I've had those experiences before. And some of the intents I had, which they did express the first night, but they also stated that you've already experienced that. You already know this. Why do you want to do that again? And it was as if they were telling me, you already have some of your capabilities. You already confronted a lot of your emotions in the past. You don't need to go any deeper to purge and to release that, to heal. You already have healed. 
So what did I get out of this? Well, I'm still processing that, and it may take a few more days. I do know from my previous relationship, they showed me that the whole purpose and the understanding of what I took with this was the relationship I had with her daughter. The fact, the the care, the, the love, and the possibility of a family, even if the child's not my daughter, that I could have that with someone else's child. And that I truly do want to have a family with a child. And that I'm capable of loving that child as if it was my own, as that child loved me, as if I was part of the family. That was a wonderful thing to experience and see that that's what you got out of that experience. Because I have been saying, what, what was the purpose of all this? Why did I have to feel this pain? Why did I have to go through that? Why was I treated that way? Well, we wanted to show you this. And this is what you experienced. Okay, I got it. I got it. I've healed from that. Didn't really need to see my dad much more because I have experience with him off and on. I've healed from that. Other past relationships, I've healed from that. My path and destiny said you already know what your path and destiny is. We've told you many times. You know this. We don't need to tell you again. So, what did I get out of it? Well, A little bit more of my cats, a greater understanding of the relationships, where I'm at, that I am where I need to be. Everything is okay. I am healed. But what's not healed is my neck. And I hoped that my neck... Now, I did feel stuff the first night and the second night. And maybe my neck is going to begin to heal from this. I do know my brain feels different. I'll tell you that. I feel a little bit more clearer um, in the moment present. I'm excited for what this week is going to bring with clients and work in the following week and, you know, friendships and relationships moving forward, how I'm going to be more in the present. I feel that, which is good. I feel I've taken all the pain or whatever else I still had inside me that was negative, whether demonic, evil, or just nightmarish or, you know, heavy burdened, oppressive stuff has all been turned into Something positive, creative, something more beautiful, which is telling us is that whatever happens to us, we can eventually metamorphosize and have it turn into something else. If we become fearful and we allow it to control and absorb us and, and you know mold us into something else, we're allowing that to happen. That we have the creative capability to take an experience and turn it into something else down the road. Not feel that that is who I am just because of that, or that is going to make me who I am, forced upon me, manipulate me, deceive me, or because something someone has done something to me that that's who I'm going to be the rest of my life because they did that to me. That we have the capabilities and the power to shift and change that and mold that into something better. That that does not determine who we are because the power of creation in the universe is constantly changing metamorphosizing into something else. And we need to metamorphosize with that. We need to adjust and adapt with that. Because if we don't, we get stuck and lost and left behind. And that's where the pain and the depression begins. I don't feel any sadness or depression at all. I'm just so neutral right now. And the interesting thing, during the entire night, I would hear there's a couple people that had a hard time emotionally. They got really sick. And this really affected them in a bad way. And it's like I wanted to get up and go help them. And then some other people I heard crying. I wanted to go counsel them and walk them through that. But a voice says, no, Chris, you're here for yourself, for your own lessons. There are teachers in place that will help them, allow them to help them. Many times in your life, you stop what you're doing instead of working on yourself and getting through it and completing your own mission of fixing yourself, whatever you're racing out to help other people. You... You have to fix yourself right now. You have to understand this so that you are whole to be there for others. But the one, two things I do want to mention is where I was able to still do what I I needed to do as a person and what I do is during the download, um, a couple individuals were sharing their stories and I would see spirits around them and two individuals were, the two sisters were telling their stories and one, her mom came through their mom came through and appeared to them. And they got to see their mom who had passed away. 
And it was very emotional, like, oh, my God, I love you, Mom. Please don't go, don't go. And they saw their mom starting to leave. And all of a sudden, I saw something move behind them in the other room. And I looked, and I saw a woman standing there in a yellow cream dress looking at them. And that was their mother. And she was saying to them, I'm still here. I'm never going away. Like, she was calling out to them, hoping that they would be able to see her and feel it. And I said, I, and I, the person next to me, I said, look, their mother is standing behind them about 15 feet away. So... When we were all beginning to leave, I walked up and I told them, I want you to know your mother was there. And she was telling you that she's always with you. And she's like, the girl tells me, thank you very much. There was another person the day before I saw someone hovering above her. And I made a promise to her. I said, listen, I want us to sit down. I want to see if I can communicate with this person through you, for you. Because they had told me that, um, yes, they did lose someone recently, a male that had committed suicide. That was very important to them. So I said, well, I want to make contact with them for you. So we sat down on one of the patios and uh, came through. And I used one of the apps after I was telling her what I was getting and she told me the story and I was telling her what I felt on the other side he was saying and feeling and the universe was guides were telling me a little bit about him. I said, well, let's try to communicate with him. She's like, what? I said, hear his voice. Let's hear directly, not just from me, but I want you to hear from them. So I took out one of the apps and I started asking questions to the spirits to help us, to guide us to have him come forward, and sure enough, he comes forward, says thank you, says a whole bunch of things that are personal I don't want to get into, even described that his dog is there, named the dog, and says, yes, he's with me, and it was it was beautiful because she was tearing up. In the bereavement process, the grieving process she's been going through that's been bearing down her soul so much, she needed this space, this this conversation one last time with him to know a few things. And I sat there going, this is why I'm here. Not just for me, but the universe also brought me here to do this. This is my purpose. This is why I'm here. And I've known this for for years. But I was grateful to be able to give that to some of the people that needed just a little bit more from this plant medicine ceremony. And if the universe was showing me this, presenting the opportunity that I knew I had to fulfill that. But I also asked permission. I said, would you like, I didn't say, hey, I need to do this. Can I have permission to tell you something? Do I have permission to sit down and do this? Would you like to do this? Yes. Okay. Then because I can, I need to. And I remember my friends and they're like, hey, you know, we're ready to go. I said, I need 20 minutes with this person and then we can leave. Okay. They gave me that space because they know what I do, and I appreciate that. So once I was done with her, I closed it, and we went on our way. Gratitude was given. Thank you. Well, thank you for allowing me to share my gift and to assist you with delivering this message. Message has been delivered. The work is done. This is all part of my bridge. Why I came back, these people, and as I sat there looking at a lot of these people over the last two nights, some of these people were there on that bridge. And some of these people are doing exactly what I'm doing with others. And I saw many of these people that have gone through so many. And here's the thing. So many people there have gone through so much. It made me realize that so many people on this planet are suffering, are really hurting. They've gone through so much. I just want everybody listening that's listening to this, you know, as I'm recording this. And I'm still in Utah recording this on this recorder. We're not alone. So many people out there are hurting, suffering, trying to find themselves. Many are suicidal or were suicidal at some point. Some are just barely holding on. But the beautiful thing is is that you're not alone. And it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to be stuck that way. As I shared my cats, I said, it wasn't for my cats, I might not be here today. Because I wanted to give up years ago. You know, when I thought I'd lost everything and I didn't feel whole anymore because of my car accident, I couldn't do the things that I couldn't do, that I used to be able to do. I didn't feel myself anymore. My friends were treating me differently. I was alone. But I wasn't alone because those cats came into my life. And the thing is, is sometimes people come into our life and we have to accept them. We have to allow them to help us. Now we can't become a burden on them. We have to do the work. 
we have to be active and in motion to also help ourselves. If we're constantly relying on other people to heal us and this and that, we're never going to heal. We can allow people to show us the way to support us, but we must eventually get on our two feet, grow, and move on. We can't always play a victim. If we're always playing a victim, that's what we become. Those images and machineries don't evolve. They don't metamorphosize into something else. They stay that way as everybody else moves on. And that's where the pain and the depression comes. We cannot think of ourselves as the same person we were before. We have to evolve and metamorphosize into something else. Regardless of what we've been through. And we have to find what it is to metamorphosize into. We have to be careful. We don't metamorphosize into an addiction or something else. We must find something more beautiful and more positive, such as me seeing the maggots and the death then turn into something more beautiful. These trees and grass and flowers and butterflies and and these negative demonic entities that would suppress us or cause more further pain down our life, metamorphosize into these geometric patterns and these beautiful colors and these pieces of artwork, turn it into something else. If you look around the world, there's many people that have had very dark stories. Some have been sexually abused, beaten, lost everything, suffered horrible physical tragedies, are in wheelchairs, lost arms, legs, whatever, but still go out there and realizing they can create and express what they still have, and they need to do something with that, not only to better themselves, to feel a part of this world, but then also to contribute to the world. And you look at them, wow, they're, they're strong. Well, you can be strong too. And that's the whole point of life is being inspired by them. If they can do this, then I must do it my way and find some way to do it. And that's what I was seeing from all of this, that my past and what I went through the last 10 years, and especially the last year or two, as difficult as it was, does not mean that I am still that particular person. I must change. I must grow. The machinery, the clock must turn. The wheel must spin to a different position. And from that position, I grow and expand into something else. You know, the caterpillar that becomes a butterfly. And then the butterfly that eventually dies or becomes food for something else or goes into the ground. And then it replenishes part of the ground and then branches and and grass and other things grow from it and then that turns into something else that is your life you must constantly be moving in emotion creating growing and turning into something else if this happens okay it's not the end it's the end of that but then turn that or wherever you're at in that position in your life turn that into something else that's what i kept seeing over and over all night it makes me excited with where I go from here what else can I create and become a part of as we left I went around hugging many of these people telling them how worthy they were how important and I'm so grateful that they're still here today to have heard their story to remind them that they have a purpose and they exist and that I'm grateful to be standing there right now giving them that hug and getting to know their spirit and soul within that time frame and that space that I did That's what was so amazing. There were so many people that were similar to what I've gone through. And a lot of people differently. But we all had that same common growth that we wanted. And we all were part of that space. So for me, this was a wonderful, wonderful weekend and journey. And I'm excited to where I go now. I am not the same person I was a couple days ago. It's not as dramatic as I thought it would be, but it didn't need to be because that was already with inside me. I was already going through this change. This just added to it, I should say. I know I'm going to see things differently with other people that may not be in the same wavelength and frequency as me. It's perfectly okay because now I'm moving forward where I need to create and to do things and expand even further than I have in the past. My hope is that my neck will continue to heal, that my brain has been reset, so that part's okay. And then if the journey is where I still have pain within my neck, which I still do, then I continue to move forward while I create to find that solution, to find out where it is. If this doesn't work, 
Something else has to. And if that doesn't work, there's got to be something else. I'm not going to give up. But along the way, I'm going to continue to contribute and create because that's why we're here. Thank you. I'm going to end this recording. Once again, today is Sunday, February 6th, and I am in Utah. I will be flying back tomorrow to Chicago. I hope you're able to walk away with something from this podcast that it resonated or touched you in a certain way. This is the end of Spirit Talk, episode 131 on plant medicine. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you next episode with our new guest.